Welcome to episode two of an understanding. Uh, this episode will be about John Adams. Uh, if you like it, listen. If you don't, so be it. This will be a deep dive on his life, legacy, etc., etc. Hope you all enjoy. <clears throat> Who is John Adams? Well, weird voice that I keep doing for some reason. John Adams is our second president, and one of the most fascinating founding fathers of all time. And one whose legacy has been really hurt in a lot of aspects, in a lot of ways, um, just for a multitude of reasons. You know, because, you know, I think outside of George Washington and Thomas Jefferson most and Benjamin Franklin, I don't think most people know the significance of a lot of the other founding fathers for the most part. I mean, most people don't even know who the hell James Monroe even is, even though he's our fifth president. But John Adams is an example of someone who I think is like a top-tier founding father. If you had to rank them... You know, he'd be up there, but he'd be like a definitely a tier below, say, Washington and Jefferson in terms of historical legacy and how we remember and perceive them. Even though he actually probably had one of the most fundamental founding building blocks that would actually... He's the single most, outside of Washington, in my view, uh, and the single most important founding father in terms of actually saving and winning the revolution, and at the very least, the fundamental founding and core, I would say, um, in some ways, of the Constitution, the creation of the Constitution, in many aspects. And I'll get to my reasons for it in some, in a little bit when I when I explain his life and everything about that. But I like to start off by asking and saying, you know, why is his legacy so hampered for someone that I think so highly of? You know, it's complicated. You know, when you really look at some of the writings, for instance, of how, how a lot of the founding fathers really, you know, looked at him, how they perceived him, it wasn't very positive. Um, a lot of it was just because of his personality. You know, I'll get to that in just a second. And the other aspect, too, was um, in a very complicated presidency, and I think a very complicated time uh, within the federal government in general, that I think really was a very difficult time and ruined a lot of relationships and really just ruined who he was in what I think a lot of people perceived as a, you know, push for excessive power of the federal government, the federal powers. And it's a very difficult time, too, and I think his presidency is a very controversial and one that I think really would effectively ruin a lot of, the like, the potential for, for a federalist to rule and run. Which is unfortunate. Uh, how do I... I can't explain how, his personality, to be honest with you. You know, the best way I can explain it, though, if I, if I would attempt, is... you Because know, you have to compare him to other people and other presidents. And when I was, when I was doing my research into George Washington and John Adams, you know, I, they're both diametrically different in, in a very unique way. And what I mean by that is... Washington is a very simple man in a very complex and complicated way, and John Adams is a very complicated and complex man in a very simple way. You know, they're diametrically opposed in, in those ass in those ways. And the best way I can explain it is this: is this okay? When you look into George Washington, he's a very simple man. There's really nothing deeper than what you really get with Washington. You know, he might have held some things close to the vest and he wasn't a very talkative person and a lot of his writings you know they don't they're not very detailed but i think that was on purpose you know he's a very intelligent man but a very simple man in how he was going about his life etc everything you know and the reason why i think he's simple is because of a multitude of complex things you know things he observed and saw during his upbringing you know, he had like fifteen different like fa like father figures in his life. Ultimately, that would really shape him. You know, and a lot of events that would really shape him to be the kind of person that he is. And Adams is kind of the opposite. You know, he's a very simple man at his core. Because when I look at Adams, I see one thing, and I see the heart and personality of someone who's just a natural born rebel. That's the only way I can explain it. You know. And everything that happens in his life, his personality, et cetera, et cetera, is really just branched off from this rebellious nature that he has for the most part, you know. Like, you know, when, when, I, when I say a rebel, it's just like, even from the get-go in his early going, he's always trying to prove something. He's always trying to right wrongs. He's always going against somebody, you know, whether it's like his school teacher who, you know, 
it's like would name him like this mischievous child his relationship with his father who he loved but he was always rebellious against and even like in his later and older age he's basically just challenging people he's pushing people he's always right and i'm going to do the right thing and i'm going to do this you know and like everything stems from that rebellious nature his personality his brashness specific moments in his time where it's literally just it's very simple that it's just adams the rebel incarnate you know and i think in a lot of instances that could be really good but unfortunately especially during his time uh, i guess you could say in the federal office for the most part as vice president president it rubbed a lot of people the wrong way you know like the best way i could explain john adams is he's just this person that in a very i guess specifically like virginian kind of like victorian like like people back then weren't brash they were they always beat around the bush like hmm Timmy, you did you do this or do that or to you know they lead the conversation to a particular you know direction and adams is just a blunt person and he's just like hey fuck face like we're gonna do this we're gonna do that this is gonna happen you know i'm not going to beat around the bush and a lot of people did not like that i think the only other person that really appreciated it was hamilton in some instances but at the same time it's they don't like each other so really depends on perspective i guess you know and it's tough because you know when i look at john adams i look at a man who i he gets so put through the ringer because of just you know unfortunate historical legacy and people just downing him regardless even after his death people still down him and it's, it's unfortunate because he's also in my personal view truly truly the most principled founding father outside of obviously Washington and many aspects and ways but when I look at John Adams I look at someone and in fairness not principled when he's a president it's complicated but I'll explain why but for the most part a very principled individual you know when he believes in something he believes in it even if he's right or wrong and he go about doing it and he's just someone that happens to believe in a lot of the similar things that a lot of a lot of the good things that I think a lot of people would think of in terms of the moral rights and you know the right thing you know a lot of the founding principles of this country morally speaking i think are adams as founding fundamental principles because he was a big advocate of republicanism and basically a constitutional republic for the most part and a lot of his ideals actually i would say made it to the constitution itself and what it represents you know one example I would argue that explains why I think he's a principal person and you know the big reason why he's a big influence in the Constitution in some aspects is you know he was a representative in the council for the people in the Boston Massacre, which is something people don't know. You know I think it's really interesting because I knew that when I was going to school, but a lot of people don't realize that. And th and then when you actually get into the nitty gritty details about that particular moment, it's kind of fascinating how it went about. And I'd like to paint that picture for you just for a little bit. Imagine. It's 1770. March of 1770. The Boston Massacre just happened. Um, you're John Adams Jr., your dad's the senior, named after your dad. And, you know, you're this rising patriot lawyer from the, from, from the uh, country. You had moved your family recently from Braintree, Quincy, to... Um, Boston, because a lot of you getting a lot of your clients there, you know, a lot of British negativity and a lot of interactions between the colonists and the British, you know, sparking a lot of a lot of work for you. <clears throat> excuse me, tacos. Oh, excuse me, goddamn tacos. Carney is hot. I'm telling you. Okay. Anyways, um, I'm losing my train of thought. Uh, you're getting a lot of work there. You know, you're one of the most rising, prominent lawyers at that particular point in time, and you just said, screw it, we're going to move the entire family there. You move into this small house, this little, it's it's rickety, pointless, and your your wife's a little bit mad. So then you move to the other house, or Abby goes mad, you move to the, this bigger house, and everyone's happy. And you're just happy to have your family there. It's growing, you know. John Quincy Adams, his son, is about two, about two or three at this point, and you're getting a lot of work. Things are good. People aren't happy in Boston as the rising British uh, interference at this point is so paramount that it's basically making things just untenable with the people and the civilians at that point and leading to a lot of tensions which culminated in the Boston Massacre. So you're at home one day and then you get a knock on your door and 
in, in this case, you're John Adams. I'm, I'm saying, think in his shoes, John Adams, for all y'all. You, know, you get a knock on the door, and then bam, this British person comes up, and he's like, hey. The thing, I think he's a British mercantile individual who's working for the British people, who's represented for them. He's come with a couple people, and he's basically like, hey, Mr. Adams, can you can you please do this? You know, we've asked everyone around town, and normally we wouldn't ask you because you're this patriot person, but you, no one's going to help these people, and we need somebody to represent them. You know, he, and he thinks for a second, and after a moment of taking, you know, just thinking about it, he accepts. Because that's John Adams. And I understand this is a big moment because no one's going to take this. You know, first off, it's political suicide at that point because everyone is anti-British there. His own cousin Samuel's leading riots trying to lynch these people. You know, would lead riots over the next couple months. Because you have to understand, too, this wasn't like the trial happened the next week. No, this happened six months later when people are mad. People are just, and you know, Samuel's winning protests every single fucking day for the most part. It's political suicide. You're a patriot. You're a rising patriot. You know, you have this little Republican newsletter that you're trying to do and doing essays on Republicanism under the synonym of Humphrey Plowjogger. That's real, people. And that's beautiful. And this guy's a fucking unit chad, okay? He's awesome. Just for that alone. Anyways, it's suicide. You know, people aren't going to be happy. In fact, he would have to move his family out literally within like eight months after the trial's over just so that you know they can flee safety some some people will basically some historians and some people wrote down that that's just better for the family and whatnot but i'm like there's, you're not leaving boston for no reason okay your life's good there you know there was real fear and he did not like the british he did not like the british at all i don't want to say he hated them but he believed that the British were not a very good thing. And I think a lot of his political ideals at, and at, at that time with the British were a little bit complicated. But for him to do that, to fundamentally give these men the right to counsel, because no man should not be without counsel, I think is incredible. It's an important moment. And it shows the level of character that this man has. So, you know, six months later, because, again, like I said, six months, he's trying to compile all the witnesses, et cetera, et cetera, and he gets uh, this guy, uh, Quincy, um, what's his name? Uh, Josiah. Josiah Quincy. He's his former classmate, and uh, to be part of his council, along with um, Samson Blowers, who's this loyalist lawyer. Lived to be 100, by the way. That's a very odd fact. Anyways... They basically argued for days, cross-examining, because, you know, especially at that time, too, different lawyer, different judicial system in some some senses. I mean, similar parliamentary kind of um, judicial system, for the most part, to today. But back then, you know, if one of those men was found guilty with intent to kill, they were all going to be hanged, every single one of them. So John Adams fights, fights hard. He argues relentlessly because that's just John Adams. And he quits basically all the men of the of the intent to kill. Two of them are, are are found guilty of manslaughter, but it's a much, much lesser charge. And they're all not going to die. And then John Adams, soon after, about several months later, is basically forced to leave uh, Boston and move the family back to the farm in Quincy and Braintree. And it's it's things like this. When you hear stories like this about, about John Adams, and there's several of these stories... That's just who John Adams is. You know, he's a smart man. He's a brilliant man. And he's a good man. And I would argue, basically, if you just had to look at John Adams... <coughs> excuse me, tacos. And how I would basically characterize who he is and just explain in one sum, you know, of who John Adams is, his legacy, everything. John Adams is fundamentally one of the most important patriots and one of the most important founding fathers we ever had, who was an absolute victim of relatively historical bias and historical inaccuracies, and unfortunately, you know, rightfully so, um, history look historically looked down upon, partially due to his personality and the rough realities of 
the situations that he was put in. You know, I know, I know that's a mouthful, but I guess what I'm trying to say is, is, you know, it's you have to understand a lot of the things in a lot of context. You know, like he's not a perfect person, a perfect individual, but he also did a lot of things for the revolution itself. That you know, us outside of George Washington, I think he's probably the second most important figure in terms of all the things that he ends up doing to help basically save this war. You know, and, and the truth is the revolution isn't one by one person. You know, if you had to put the people in a hierarchy of importance, obviously George Washington's number one. You know, we'd still be eating fucking cookies, calling them biscuits, okay? My lord, that'd be horrifying. But anyways, you know, John Adams is probably a, a distant but very, you know, reasonably c- close second for the most part. I mean, he negotiates so many things with just the French alone. And his entire life and entire time during the entire revolution is fascinating. And without him, you know, it makes Washington's life a little more difficult. Far more difficult. We don't get treaties that are much more favorable to the Americans without him. You know, everything he does for, I guess you could say, in terms of being one of the greatest ambassadors in some aspects. Or one of the first ambassadors. And, you know, his capabilities of foreign influence. And he does so much that it's very difficult for me to just say in this one little lump sum without having to go into, there's the whole point of these deep dives is I can't just do these things without explaining the entire life of the particular individual he's also a victim of circumstance too you know like to become the first vice president you know it, it's difficult you know especially for him because you know he's a very prideful person I mean at one point he didn't want to become the vice president because he thought it was, it was less than you know, he, he valued character, authority, and stuff like that, and power in some instances, just like a lot of those people back then. And, you know, he but he still did his duty. He did it because it was Washington, and he just said, I'll do it for you, Washington. Even though at that point, the relationship was a little bit strained, so it's a little bit complicated for them. You also have to understand, too, that he's following the first president. You know, Washington setting all these precedents, and setting all these rules, et cetera, et cetera, that how, how we should follow. And, like, you know, what is Adams to do? Is he gonna just going to keep doing what Washington is doing, or is he going to do his own thing? You know, these are unprecedented times because Washington kept the peace, but Adams is going to keep the peace. You know, he's the second president, you know, and people don't think about that, you know. And people don't think it's 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 a bit of a weird and weirdness and changing of the powers for the most part. And I think people need to keep that in mind that, you know, he's the second one. He's not Washington. He's going to be looked down upon in relative comparison to Washington, regardless, you know. The truth is, is if Jefferson had won the second presidency, the truth is, is I think that a lot of the same shit would happen with Adams. That happened with Adams would happen with Jefferson. Jefferson would only get one term and, you know, history might be different. You know, that's the truth. And that's you know, a lot of what ifs happen. History is funny like that, I think. You know, it and it's opportunity, it's potential, and you know, I always ask questions of you know, like, could these people do these exact things, or if things were different, you know, what if Madison gets bold and decides he wants to run for president, you know, instead of Jefferson, you know, things happen, but to be the second and to follow the man like Washington is tough. I don't think anyone could have done it, and I think for the most part, I think Adams did as well as he probably could have, but it's debatable though. Adams is a good man. I think fundamentally and principally in a lot of the things that effectively help create this nation, you know. And I think there's like maybe a handful that fundamentally pointed our country in the direction that we are pointed in. You know, there's a whole bunch of people that do a whole bunch of different things. You know, a lot of people don't give John Marshall a lot of credit. And he's probably the single most important Supreme Court justice we've ever had in this country's history. That would shape the direction of how this country would go. You know, he's one of the he's one of the these founding fathers specifically who are in this group. You know, Washington, Jefferson, even Benjamin Franklin to an extent, you know. Madison and I think Adams is one of the most important of all those people, in my personal view. Because without Adams, a lot of things don't happen and without Adams, I don't know. We probably won't be drinking tea or, you know, eating biscuits. Or calling cookies biscuits. But I think a close second would be John Adams in that relative reality to Washington. That if it's not for him, we would still be drinking tea and calling cookies biscuits. So anyways, where do we begin with John Adams? 
Let's start off with his childhood. So John Adams is born in October 30th, 1735 in Massachusetts. <clears throat> Massachusetts has a really long history. You know, along with Virginia, I could probably do just entire podcast, like another episode specifically on just Massachusetts, okay? Because it has a very long history, Magna Carta, all of that, you know, and I can only do so much. Otherwise, this is going to be like a fucking 15 hour long episode, and y'all are probably miserable just hearing me speak. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, how do I explain Massachusetts, though? Massachusetts is very different from Virginia. It's. Its economy is very different, you know. Virginia, and for the most part, a lot, most of the southern uh, colonies, in particular, were, were basically just agricultural farming uh, colonies, tobacco, wheat, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And Massachusetts dabbled in that a little bit for the most part, but most of their economy is structurally and fundamentally based in trade, mercantile, uh, textiles. They did a lot of lumber, fishing, ports, you know, and. You know, well, and they trade a lot of stuff from the other colonies for the most part. They they would trade to the British. You know, little things like that for the most part. You know, I, I will say this though about Massachusetts. It's it should be noted that it's one of the first colonies that really was a leading leader. I guess that sounds horrible, and confusing. I need to go back to school for English. Um, leader in the uh, ab- abolishing slavery. Um, Notably, by the way, through court cases, not through legislation. I think it's very interesting. You know, it was this lawyer, Benjamin Kent, who's actually a friend of John Adams at the time. Um, he actually led one of the first trials, um, the freedom of slavery. I think it was uh, Slew v. Whipple uh, winning the suit and helping, basically setting the precedent, I guess you could say, for the freedom of a lot of these slaves and the abolition eventually um, through more court cases. And then eventually through legislation, just outright for the most part. Um, notably, what I want to say too, Adams never owned slaves. He's actually one of, the found, uh, one of the few founding fathers, along with Hamilton, to never actually own a slave. His family and his life, it's very interesting. You know, he, I he's not wealthy, you know, but he's also not... I guess poor either. You know, he's, his family is well off. His, his father... His father was a tax collector. He known he was known as this was was known as a freeholder, meaning uh, he actually owned land. He was a free man who owned land, did not rent. A lot of people rented land at that point in time. A lot of them were tenant farmers, but he actually owned land. Just by virtue of him owning land, he was much more of a well well off person for the most part. He's also a shoemaker, a cobbler, I guess you could say. And you know, he would, during the the main farming seasons, he would farm, and then you know then he would do a shoe business on the side uh it's his he, john Adams senior is a very interesting person you know he's he's kind of like a rebel too a lot of the things that because i look at it this way you know if you want to know john quincy adams and you want to know john adams start with the father you know a lot of the the values that he ended up instilling in john adams that john adams would ironically instill into john quincy adams it's, it's a lot of the same thing you know, discipline, et cetera, et cetera, um, principles that, you know, to do the right thing. I think the rebellious nature, though, was always going to be with John Adams. It's not so much with John Quincy Adams until John Quincy Adams actually gets a, a little bit older and, um, and becomes much more of a, of a congressman. His mother, though, it's, um, this it's, it's is interesting. It's a lot with the, with the other founding fathers, too, and not just, um, like Jefferson or Madison. It, it, all of them for, <laughs> Excuse me. All of them outside of Washington, um, their relationships with their mother and a lot of they just their hit like the mother's history, for instance. It's not really well known. Uh, his mother was Susan Boylan. Um, just her entire life is not particularly well known. All what is known is her family was a little bit more prominent than say her father. Um, but you know she had specifically there's no writings of her. And for some reason, John Adams and a lot of other founding fathers really don't talk about their mothers too much for whatever reason. You know, some might say they may have a difficult relationship, but, you know, what is known is, you know, at the very least, you know, it's an, I guess, non-emotional, genuine care from his mother for the most part. You know, some people even said that she's possibly literate, but it's also probably not accurate to say because John Adams would always have some writings about her being happy that 
she read a lot of the things that John Adams would legislate, et cetera, et cetera. It's a complicated relationship. But if I had to guess specifically, I think she was just a good woman that just raised her son, although it's probably really clear that a lot of the influence of who John Adams was came from his father, um, for better or worse, whatever your personal opinion is of it. John Adams, though, was the oldest of four children. He was named after his father. You know, and he had a very close relationship with his father, as I said before, and what he he actually considered, you know, a really blessed childhood with his siblings. He was also cousins with Samuel Adams, notably. Um, a lot of his a lot of his siblings aren't very well documented. The only one that I think was really well documented, and I can't pronounce this motherfucker's name, is Ethiu, E T H I U. I'm totally sorry. <laughs> But he was a he was a soldier during the Revolutionary War. He would die of dysentery. Um, but he was generally pretty close with with a lot of his childhood um, siblings, and you know go hunting with them all the time whenever he get an opportunity. If not, you know helping his father on the farm, and doing random deeds and learning and reading and all that. Schooling though was very interesting. He wasn't he was a fantastic student, but a mischievous one is probably how I would put it. You know. <laughs> He was always thinking about other things. You know, it's not like he didn't like reading. He loved reading everything that he can get his hands on. You know, political theories, philosophy, etc., etc., etc. The problem is, is that, you know, schooling and I think just being taught. And by, you know, being taught to a teacher, I think, really just, it does not vibe with him for the most part, you know. And there's, there's, there's some initial debate about his upbringing for the most part in terms of his schooling um cuz there's some most people would say he was homeschooled but primarily probably by tutors not by his family or parents specifically and then he would actually go to school but his school's a little his school was you know not very he was a very mischievous student at least by um what the actual teachers basically said <laughs> cuz like sometimes he would always just be he he always bring a gun to school which I think is very interesting because how times have changed. Uh, but he always bring a gun to school because he's always thinking about going hunting or after school to be with his friends and family and all that and siblings. From an early age, um, his family wanted things to be different for him. His family had very... I'll put it to you this way. John M. Cena did not want to be a farmer and he did not want his son to be a farmer. He wanted his son to do something and to do something that was going to be beneficial for him. And one thing to be beneficial was to be a minister for the church and whatnot. You know, you could be a lot of things if you're a minister, but above all else, you know, especially for John M. who loves to read and whatnot, you know, he could be a teacher. And I think a lot of, and I think his father probably put two and two together, at least in some way, shape, and form in that particular you know, and, and John Adams, he just didn't want to do that. You know, John Adams Jr., he actually liked farming. He liked being in the country. He enjoyed the outdoors, his youthfulness, etc. You know, when you're a young kid and a young adult, you don't you don't think about, like, like what young kid's going to want to be into politics, for instance. You know, he, it's, he didn't think he was going to be this in the future. You have to understand that. You know, think about John Adams as a kid. He's this young, kind of really independent rebel in a lot of aspects. And... If he, wants to, like, if he could choose, I think back then, he probably would have been like maybe a militia soldier at that point in time. Or he might have, like I don't know, been a hunter, been a scavenger in some way, shape, or form. You know, I think he wanted to just do a lot of those things, you know. And his father didn't want him to do that. His, his father wanted him to be a good man and a great man and someone that was of stature, of, you know, of importance in some way, shape, or form. So, one day, this story at the very least, John Adams uh, tells his father he wants to be a farmer. He wants to do this and do that. And, you know, he, John Adams, he's relegated to basically just being a farmer in some way, shape, or form at this point because he doesn't like school. He doesn't particularly, he, he's not super interested in it as much as he really wished he, could, he would be for the most part. He wants to be a kid. So, his father basically says, All right, if you want to be a farmer, then you're going to have to work. You have to work as hard as possible. So his, his father actually works him hard, I think, for a day. Some stories to go back and forth for a couple days. And after, I guess you could say, hard farm working, from like sun up to sun down, his father asks him, hey, you like this? And his son basically is just like, 
yeah, I, I like it well, father. You know, he hated it, but him being a, a fucking OG rebel, gangster rebel, he's basically just like, I don't care. I'm going to prove you wrong regardless because that's just how John Adams is, you know. That being said, you know, he, he did, I think, and partly probably because of that moment, and a whole bunch of other moments in his life where, you know, you grow up and you start thinking differently, you know, maybe when you're 13, 14, you know, you, you probably grow out of maybe going hunting with your siblings and you're thinking to yourself, what am I going to do with my life? Because especially you have to under, understand too, 13, 14, you're basically the equivalent of like an 18, 19 year old at that point in time, you know, like most people went to college at 15, how times have changed. Anyways, you know, John Adams is really thinking about his future. He's trying to figure out what he's going to do with the rest of his life, you know. There's, he has actually a lot of options, you know. Maybe he could, go, he could go down the path of his father, be a minister. Maybe he could join the militia, be a, part, be, a, like, be a military man. You know, he's really thinking about this. And this is when he actually really starts, you know, taking school seriously. This is when he starts doing some preparatory schooling and starts actually getting thinking I'm going to to do something. I'm going to learn. I'm going to actually be something for myself and be something and do something with my life. You know, he wanted to be someone great. You know, he, he someone who had a lot of status. He wanted to be somebody in some way, shape, or form. He wanted to be an important person. You know, and you can argue this was because his father and parents didn't really pay attention to them. I don't think it's because of that. I just think his parents instilled something in him that made him want to achieve greatness. You know, whatever that is for the most part. Or maybe at the very least just self-confidence that, hey, I can do this. And I can really achieve a lot of things. I I work hard and I can do this. And I think it's really, you know, it's much different than, yeah. But for the most part, you know, when John Adams gets an opportunity, you know, he applies and gets a scholarship, actually, to Harvard, you know. And you have to understand that, you know, in order to get a scholarship, he had to have some status with you, and he had to, had to use his mother's status, unfortunately. His father was more of a self-made man, and basically, in order to get those means um, to come from a pop, pop, prominent family like his mother's, he had to use his mother's name, etc., etc. Anyways, he gets a grant from Harvard, and effectively starts going to school at Harvard when he's 15 years old. So he's at Harvard, and he's awesome. He's excelling academically, although the academic records are not really there. It's interesting, because he ranked 15th in his class, but it wasn't based off academic. It was based off of social uh, status and standards. I always found that a little bit fascinating. Um, but effectively, he ends up becoming a really solid student. He's a fantastic orator and a great debater and a great speaker. You know, so I I look at a young John Adams, this great speaker with a solid moral foundation, a deeply opinionated John Adams as a rebel in every single word that you can think of. You know, and once he graduates Harvard, you know, he's really still conflicted with effectively what he wants to do with his life in some way, shape, or form. You know, his father and his and he would actually have a very religious family with religious values, and effectively he ends up deciding, you know what. I'm going to be a lawyer. Probably sees a bunch of people, sees a lot of lawyers making a lot of money, traveling around the country and the colony for the most part, handing out a bunch of cases. So he decides, I'm going to be a lawyer. So once he graduates from Harvard, he starts teaching school. And while teaching school, he studies under uh, James Putnam, uh, who was a prominent lawyer back then. Because back then, ironically, uh, Harvard didn't teach law back then, or at least didn't prepare you for there was no law schools back then so if you're going to actually be a lawyer and this would be for every other founding father who was a lawyer um you had to study under someone and specifically you know you had to work for them and then get their books so that you could study them and basically learn from them so you can take the bar um for your specific colony in order to actually you know become a registered lawyer and he did that he did that for years basically four years once he graduates i believe around 1755 excuse me um about 18 19 and 20 and then he actually takes the the bar exam and becomes a lawyer in 1759 so once Adams becomes uh the lawyer in uh 1759 you have to understand that this is i mean 1759 the, the french and Indian wars and basically full swing a lot of things are still happening um you know, rising anti-British sentiments happening, and specifically happening starting really in Massachusetts. They're 
basically the beginnings of the revolution for the most part. So if you want to thank anyone for the revolution, you can thank the people of Massachusetts for the most part. Um, you know, at this point, you know, Adams, he's not... I guess you could say he's very anti-British, but not, like, vehemently so at this point in time, you know. Um, you know, he sees a lot of things happening, both in the cities and then a lot of the other places in the countryside where, and, you know, the British are basically impeding a lot of the rights of particular citizens and individuals, you know. And in particular, um, well, he, nothing really happens for him, at least for a couple of years for the most part, um, as he basically tries to build up his practice, be this lawyer, you know, taking cases farm by farm, eventually in the cities. Eventually, he would actually his part of part of his uh his his job would take him up north. But anyways, John Adams is not a part of this Revolutionary War cause yet. He doesn't really become it until he actually gets to see uh this this lawyer named James Otis Jr. Uh, case specifically. He's a this he's this well respected lawyer where Adams uh, was able to actually see the arguments. It's known as the writs of assistance, I guess. What it was. I mean, the closest thing, I guess you could say, is a warrant, but it's not really technically accurate to say that it's a warrant. It's basically the specific uh, thing that Otis Ward, Warren Jr., uh, James Otis Jr., was basically trying to go against, which it gave the British leeway to tax, do whatever they want as liberally as they wanted to do, you know, taxes. And that's actually where specifically the famous taxation with that representation might have come from. I mean... There's a whole bunch of different sources that I've been looking up and trying to get the actual confirmation of it. But generally speaking, that's actually where the uh, the general, you know, beginnings of that came from. You know, and it's around this period of time that, you know, you know, he's not this part of this revolution, but he's very aware of it. You know, and he starts getting his own ideas and his own interpretations of it. You know, and, and Adams has a very complex view, I would say, of Britain and I think of just the idea of what Britain was doing and whatnot, because I think, and I'm just, I'm, gonna, I'm basically just going to go into it a little bit later, but to begin with it, you know, his ideals probably at this point are, you know, I don't like the British, but at the same time, with everything that's happening, you know, for us to go to war, it's not really feasible, and it'd be foolish to do so, and at the very least until something, you know, specific and big happens, um, we're going to be their citizens for the most part. So anyways, he, he becomes a lawyer and he starts doing a bunch of uh, cases all around Massachusetts. And actually, you know, he's taking everything that he can. And he's this really prominent, outspoken, brash, stubborn lawyer who ends up winning a lot of cases. And people like him and people basically start flocking to him. He even actually has cases up in basically the area that would effectively be Maine yet. It wasn't a state back then. Um, helping people, mainly with farming cases. And, you know, Boston specifically as you know a lot of problems and conflicts are happening uh, happening with people from Boston and um, and uh, the British uh, it's it's difficult too for him at times because you have to understand you know class is everything class is still every class is a little problem today let's just be honest with that I'm it, no, I don't want to get political, but for the most part, like I don't think a lot of the, the racial things are actually racial. I think it's more of a class issue than anything else because class, even back then, was still pertinent and important in uh, even in this time and era. What I mean is, like, he's a farmer's lawyer, and a lot of people do not look, you know, fondly on farmers and farmer lawyers for the most part. It was like a second class kind of lawyer in a lot of instances, in a lot of ways. So when he moved to Boston, he actually got he was no longer this farmer's lawyer. He's something else, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and it was very just very different back then. Even in Massachusetts, where there's still class, even though the more class-based stuff is probably happening in Virginia. You know, around this time too, like, you know, Adams is kind of a bro. He's just like dating, just chilling. You know what I'm saying? There's a couple girls he's courting at one time. Um, I kid, obviously. He's not a play. He's a much more, you know, good man, good mannered, good natured man. He's basically just courting as a couple girls though you know and he, he's deeply lonely obviously etc etc you know yada 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 and there's a couple instances where he actually almost proposes but you know the moment was lost you know man but lame i know but on the bright side things positively look out for him so after some time you know he's about 28 by the time he meets uh abigail um 
Abigail, the future wife, essentially. Notably, his third cousin, and one might want to add. But effectively, they end up uh, getting really acquainted to each other. Really, they meet, and it's kind of just, you know, when you meet someone, it's kind of just, damn. I don't know what it is about you. I just want to get to know you. It's kind of like one of those particular instances. I think she was 19 or something at the point. There's, there's about a decade or so difference um, in their ages. Or about eight, not a decade, but it, it's a prominent gap, I would probably say. I, mean, I don't have their actual specific ages. Um, but effectively, they're taken by each other, specifically. And, you know, it's, it's also debatable about how the families felt about each other. You know, some stories say that her mother was so happy that she was marrying John, but then at the same time, she's also really disheartened because he's a farmer's lawyer, you know, class, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Anyways, the two get married. And I'll just briefly explain their marriage because, at least in relative comparison to, say, Washington, their marriage was something quite beautiful. Really, really beautiful. You know, like... How, how do I explain it? It's one of the true, unique, great love stories of all time. And I think a lot of presidents have um, a lot of great love stories. But for him and John, or her and John, it's specifically really, really beautiful. You know, like, because most of it, especially nowadays, it might just be more historically because you have to understand, for at, one, at one point in time, they didn't really see each other for like 12, 13 years from like the beginning of the war to him basically being a part of the uh, foreign ambassador of Britain and basically being in Europe the entire time, you know, there was a lot of periods where they did not see each other for a bulk of their lives, you know, so they would basically just write each other all the time and just so just shows the actual beauty and nature of their relationship. A lot of the correspondence, you know, being very positive and loving. And he was basically, she was basically like his closest advisor and confidant. A lot of people say she, Abigail was probably like the first genuine feminist kind of kind of person because she's basically like hey can we get the right to vote here you know kind of kind of thing and you know whatever you're anyone any guy's opinion i actually think it's pretty kind of badass in a lot of ways she's like not crazy she's kind of just like hey man i'll do my job i'm gonna do my wifely duty and yada yada but you know if we're gonna be doing this it's gonna be a partnership it's gonna be something beautiful and brilliant and we're gonna work at this together and i respect the hell out of her for that and john adams loved this woman to death she was his rock for every you know, when, when she dies, you know, it's a very dark period for John for a little bit because he, he ends up living for a long time. But anyways, you know, it's 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 a beautiful relationship and a beautiful marriage. And the two would have six kids together, four of them that would live into adulthood. Again, notably, you know, John Quincy Adams, you know. It's never perfect, obviously. Every single marriage has their problems. And everyone's going to have their differences and everyone's going to have their problems. And especially for a long period of time that they're away, it would, you know, be difficult. But if you want to talk about like actual great love stories and great marriages and partnerships and all this, this is probably one of the absolute strongest. And out of every single one of the presidents, it's probably easily top three in my, my personal view. So when they get married, you know, it's roughly around like 1765, for instance, you know, the Stamp Act. It, this is basically a period in time where the rising influence of Britain for the most part, it's being strangleholded on the colonies, and specifically Massachusetts, because it's the most rambunctious of the bunch, for the most part. And, you know, they need their war at, at like, debts paid off, and a whole bunch of other things. And, you know, they're, they need to take hold of the colonies before they, you know, get a little bit too extra, and before they get too, I guess you could say, thinking in liberty and freedom and all that, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. It's a very important time because John Adams' feelings on the British and, you know, the idea of a revolution is really changing too. You know, he becomes someone that's actually thinking about, you know, what works and, and as a government, I guess, in some way, shape, or form. You know, he starts thinking things out and he starts thinking, hmm, what could work? And, you know, at this point, like John Locke, a lot of Locke in philosophy, Adam Smith, everything, everything that's going to be coming starts coming within the next 15, 20 years, obviously, with economics and whatnot but you know he's thinking he's thinking for himself and he's thinking what can actually work and in thinking of what works you know he, st he starts looking into the, the actual philosophical approach you know just like a lot of the other founding fathers and a lot of the other particular individuals there he's influenced by greek philosophy and he comes up and thinks about a republic and republicanism 
you know, and he starts actually writing out his ideas in a lot of ways and in the essays uh, that he would basically disseminate into newspapers that a lot of people would read all across Massachusetts and under the pseudonym of Humphrey Plowjogging, which, you know, I'm not that creative to come up with a name like that, so I kind of have respect for the man. God damn, I love this man. You know, he was, but he was an avid, fundamental believer in a republic. You know, the Enlightenment figure, and it's a you know, deep political philosophy. And for those of you who don't know or don't functionally understand, you know, the democracy basically is what the Greeks were under, and you know, for the most part, it was actually really good. The problem is, is functionally speaking, you know majority rules or at least that's one of the consequences of it you know and a democracy can work if everyone is functionally and fully informed and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. but the truth is is that it it goes against human nature in some ways and aspects because no one's going to be fully informed and there are going to be people that are going to try and take advantage of this whole you know majority rules aspects you know and and adams did not like that he did not like a democracy he was basically a, such an avid you know, believer that democracy was going to be really bad, you know, if 51% of the population was basically like, let's all jump off a bridge with no parachutes, the other, against the will of the other 49%, there prob- there's going to be some problems, you know, but the idea of a republic, and specifically in some ways, and the early ideas of what a constitutional republic would be, was that republican rule is liberty, freedom, inalienable rights specific things that you cannot do that you cannot basically force people into do it if it is legally protected in some way shape or form you know i'm not saying he wrote inalienable rights because i think that was much more of a jefferson kind of thing um but the very least the influence of that came when they were all making uh, writing the declaration of independence anyways sovereignty of the man is what jefferson is what adams is thinking fundamentally you know, this requires people that every, you know, everyone do their duty, that no one basically violates. It's basically America. The very fundamental foundations that he's pushing. You know, this uncompromising commitment to liberty. Pushing and rooting out the corruption as much as humanly possible for as much as possible, you know. You know, and his ideas functionally and basically are, for a republic, is that we are all going to be as educated as we possibly can be. And that these are the specific rules. You know, the spe- these are the excuse me, that these are the specific things that no one can violate. And if you want to do this democracy rule thing, that's fine. But if it violates any one of these things, no bueno. It's not going to happen. You know, it's a really, really big idea. Of it. And, you know, he starts this little movement thing, these essays. You know, they don't reach the most amount of prominence, but people read them and it starts, you know, getting people a little bit curious about what liberty really is. I think it's deeply fascinating. Ams especially and specifically defines it in in his particular and own words, you know, that a republic, like specifically, is a government that all men, regardless of class, are equally subject to the law. Which, again, I want to point out again, Adams did not own slaves. I just want to point that out. So around this time, there's rising tensions. I say the war was over. British needed to recoup their finances. So they begin levying taxes to people. All these taxes especially in Massachusetts, where they are not happy with these taxes. The Stamp Act, et cetera, et cetera, you know, especially the Stamp Act. I mean, there was widespread opposition. Actually, Adams was on the forefront of this. He was not happy with this. You know, he specifically went to federal courts to an extent to have the tax removed, you know. And not, well, not specifically him, actually, but people specifically had them go to the federal courts to actually, hey, this is not legally right, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, people had to pay their taxes. So then people in Massachusetts, and I'm, this is more about the revolution now that I'm talking about than actual John Adams that I'm trying to explain. People are basically getting mad. You know, this this patriot reb, rebel movement was rising. People were using prop the newspapers as propagandas, you know. And, like, they would kind of just do little things against the British, trip them up a little bit, you know, push them around, throw snowballs at them, you know basically using a lot of and i'll I'll put it to you this way you know when people are basically saying hey you can't come and stay at our house you can't court you can't quarter in this place you know john adams is basically like well if there's gonna be a legal argument then i'm gonna be there and make some money so he's very busy man at this particular point in time so john adams is really profiting off of this 
and I think it's really deeply fascinating that Massachusetts is the one state to actually really begin all this. You know, there's opposition in other states, obviously, Virginia especially, too. Even parts of Carolinas, although there's far more loyalists down there than, at least at that point in time. Although there were a lot of people that were very opinionated, liberty-minded individuals, um, specifically around, like, where Andrew Jackson was, for the most part, too. Um, but for the most part, in Massachusetts especially, you know, rising anti-British sentiment. And so you have to understand, too, because the the main reason, partially, too, was because it was trade. You know, they were going to partially have some of their taxes and or have their goods taxed regardless. Yeah, you know, some form of tariffs back then along with the actual stamp tax themselves. So it's like, I'm paying 1% and then I'm paying another percent just for the actual stamp tax, too. It's dumb. It's ridiculous. And a lot of their economies were really built on, like, trade. You need, you need to stamp shit for the most part, you know? It's not the same, say, in the South, for instance. So I'm just going to sell you these bundles of tobacco. Although it was similar in that vein if you're going to be trading that, that tobacco. But most of them, you know, the farmers down there from a trade wheat, it's going to be going straight up north to help supply and feed people and whatnot, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and little things you have to think about and little things you have to really understand and why a lot of these things were important. It's not just because they're being taxed. It's just because they're being taxed on a livelihood to a point where it could hurt them. It could cripple them. And it's not like every single merchant up there was rich. They weren't. You know, some were poor and some were getting by, you know. I think, actually, surprisingly, the Washington show turn in the first first couple episodes especially, they show, you know, how trade, mercantile stuff kind of works a little bit. It's not easy. It's very, very much not easy. A lot of people were poor, and it was really difficult for them. So you have to understand that. You have to understand what's happening there. So anyways, Adams, and he's, he's getting a lot of work. He's getting a lot of opportunity. A lot of people are requiring his work in Boston. So he decides, hey, you know what? Let's just do it. Let's make the jump. Okay, I'm farming part-time, not being able to really do much work there, so screw it. Let's just go back. Let's just go to Boston. So he uproots his entire family, his growing family at that point. And, I mean, at this point, he's making most of his money being a lawyer, so I'm going to support my family. I'm going to do it this in this particular way, shape, and form. So in 1768, he officially moves uh, his practice uh, to Boston. It's a rough start, you know. People look down on him a little bit, like, this country guy is moving in, okay, well, whatever. But, you know, he starts building up his name, a lot of people like him. He wins a lot of cases, you know, and people start, like, okay, okay. And not, not to mention, too, he just wanted to prove people wrong. You know, he, he just has that personality where he just wants to overcome, he's just going to prove, hey, I'm not this particular individual, I'm going to be doing, et cetera, et cetera. You know, that's partially the reason why, like, he has this, he grew up in this, like, I'm not a farmer's kid, I'm just a person, so, you know, I'm going to prove you wrong that I'm not just a simple-minded lawyer. But, you know, again, not the simple-minded lawyer, um, but effectively, you know, he just wanted it to make a life for his family. And, and I would probably say at this point his idea of what, you know, he was anti-British, but he was neutral in most things because, you know, you have to understand, if you're being a patriot or being a loyalist, you know, like... Most people didn't really want to take sides because either way you're going to probably be propped by persecuted in some way, shape, or form, whether by the British if you're a patriot or if you're, you know, a loyalist by the actual patriots themselves. You know, it's 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 a difficult time. So he tried to stay neutral, take care of his family and stuff. He did have anti British sentiments, like to make that very clear. He didn't like like the British. And I think if you know, things really escalated at that particular point. He'd probably be one of the, you know, many people leading the charge against the, uh, against the British. But basically, he ends up um, just being a normal lawyer for the most part, helping people figure out their counsel. You know, he sees all this happening. He sees all the, you know, atrocities and the egregious, you know, persecution of people and the, you know, the, the I guess you could say, uh, violations of human rights. Um, these unalienable rights and whatnot, <laughs> but uh, you know he's not liking what he's seeing. You know, that being said, you know he's he's not he's just trying to live his life for the most part, and it actually becomes much more on the forefront of everything once he becomes the actual lawyer of uh, the Boston Massacre, the British soldiers of that. It that particular case actually kind of puts him in the limelight for better or worse. You know. That, where he would eventually become part of the legislature and whatnot, but that case in particular where he acquits the six soldiers um, and basically saves the other two who were who were basically accused or 
found guilty of manslaughter. Sorry, my, my brain's not working right now. Um, it changes the very direction of where he's going to be going, both politically, everything. Because at that point, he ends up just saying, you know what? Screw it. You know, I, I've done this, et cetera, et cetera. These people deserve... He takes a stand. It's very... That's, that, you have to understand, that's a big moment for him, specifically. Both in just, like, I'm going to do this because my... F- I'm going to do this the right thing. I'm also going to probably move out. It's very bold because I'm probably going to be persecuted by patriots now at this point. And also, like, I'm just going to make it very clear that if I take this case, I'm in it. I'm in this revolution game. I'm going to be in it for the next 50, 40, or 40 plus years of my life. And this is a very big moment for him when he actually does, well, 30 years realistically, uh, of my life. This is going to consume it. And I think this is like that, that big kind of like moment I would say like the the crossroads moment for him you know because I wonder what happens if he doesn't take this case or <clears throat> excuse me you know think I think or someone else takes it or you know the soldiers just all get guilty and they die like I don't know what happens because you know the soldiers being acquitted really damaged his reputation in some way should form to the patriot cause although his, a lot of people found it brave and found it really just and principled and a lot of the patriot and sam even had some kind words to say even though he was an ardent patriot but for the most part you know at this point he actually eventually does become the leading voice in massachusetts and this is a big moment for him to become that leading choice you know and i and i think in fairness too in this particular case the way he saw the british was more like you know, he thought that they were doing wrong, but they they were misguided specifically in what they were doing. You know, uh, in terms of like a lot of things. You know, because he didn't, because he didn't like the British. But I think he, he tried to be empathetic and understand, you know, their perspective and point of view around this particular time. Um, after the trials, he effectively later, but generally, leaves Boston in 1771 due to the revolutionary fervor, <laughs> and you know the potential to get hurt and whatnot from the patriots and. British alike, actually, I would probably say, you know, he just wanted to get away from it all, protect his family, so he moves back to the farm in Braintree, and effectively tries to become both a farmer and a lawyer, and he works, uh, you know, in a lot of the courts, and in, in eventually speaking, he would be part of the uh, state legislature, but he effectively basically becomes a lawyer that basically tries to fuck with judges in some way, shape, or form with a lot of the cases that he's doing for the most part. He becomes like a real civil rights activist, in, in I guess in some ways, during this period in time. And he ends up effectively being a, eventually a leading voice, you know? It's during this period of time before... I would say the Boston Tea Party and the Boston Massacre. Um, he becomes a real big voice. He basically just saying, "Hey, you know what? I may have helped these these people, but a lot of the shit that's happening, y'all gotta stop this. Y'all gotta stop this, okay?" He's very blunt about it too, so that's why I'm saying y'all gotta stop this shit, okay? But effectively, he becomes a supporter of the actual colonial cause. You know, he starts becoming a fervent rev- revolutionary in particular. Um, when he sees uh, the British bribing um, a lot of people to have you know cer- certain court cases go their particular way, he actually takes out a um, an ad in a newspaper, I think, or basically disseminates in the newspaper, which riles a lot of people up. You know that particular moment really pushes him to be a revolutionary patriot. You know I don't want to say like let's just be an independence revolutionary patriot, but for sure this puts him functionally within the cause. <laughs> Damn tacos. Um, absolutely, and really makes him one of the leaders in Massachusetts, especially at that point in uh, in time. Um, so by the time uh, 1773 happens, the Tea Party occurs, the Boston Tea Party, which it'll be a much shorter episode, but if I'm going to do, I, I think that specifically deserves an, its, its own entire little segment in history, because that moment in particular I think is a very important moment, because I don't think you understand how important that particular moment is. So I'll give you the, the Cliff Notes version of them basically dumping out, I think, to what in uh, today's money is probably close to like $1.2 million worth of tea in protest against the British. You have to understand, too, like the tea itself, it's not like tea bags. Tea bags weren't really, I don't think they were even invented back then. They was like little bricks for the most part, like little big chalk bricks that look like you know Hershey's chocolate bars when you take a little piece and you just dip it in there until the actual tea itself changes and like 
when you throw a million dollars worth of tea, like tea that can actually last you like a year or two. Like that's fucking insane to me. Little things like that. But Adams becomes such a big supporter also because, you know, his cousin's part of it. He ends up becoming the council, um, supports him if anything occurs for the most part in terms of litigation. So, you know, this is a very crazy time. Things are escalating beyond all belief and recognition once this Tea Party movement happens. This is why it's such a big moment is because that particular act escalates everything, you know. Because I remember it's three years after the Boston Massacre, but then three years after this, the Tea Party War, the Declaration of Independence, like, you know, it's kind of like, you know, when people think of, like, uh, Harambe caused all this bullshit that's ha- that's happened, like, the Boston Tea Party caused America to exist, you know, like, I, I tend to think of it in that particular same light and same vein, and I think it's funny. Um... So, due to the rising tensions in Adams becoming such an outspoken, um, you know, supporter for independence and being a leader in Massachusetts, especially, Adams effectively agrees with everyone, a lot of people, and the main people in charge of Massachusetts that something needs to happen. So, they effectively call on the other 13 colonies um, to join in what would effectively be the first Continental Congress. Except Georgia. Georgia's, they're chilling. They don't want to do, they don't want to have anything to do with this. They're cool with everything that's happening for the most part. And they're basically just okay for the most, they don't want any conflict whatsoever, which is fair in their aspect and point of view. Adams doesn't really want to go to, to this for the most part. He, he has to be coaxed by uh, Samuel Adams, his cousin. It's a very weird relationship with them. I wouldn't say they're particularly close. You know, they're only really close because of uh, the actual Revolutionary War cause. But I don't know if they're basically going to be going out for drinks, you know, every other weekend. You know, there's a bit of an age gap, too, uh, between the two of them. You know, but he's very persistent. He's basically like, John, you got to join this, man. You got to come, okay? You got to do this. So... John effectively does join the the Continental Congress, and he starts meeting a lot of the other people and the other um, independence-minded individuals. Because at this point, and I gotta be honest, at this point, fundamentally, with everything that's happening and seeing war himself as an inevitability, is a full favor advocate of independence and an advocate of revolution at the first Continental Congress. And he attempts to unite a lot of these people to this specific common cause, you know. He doesn't really want to say it out loud specifically because, you know, the idea of independence is kind of just like, ugh, you know, like that's, like, because th- at that point, most of the people basically just want to fix their relationship with Britain, you know. They just want to just not tax us, you know. Can we just come back to antebellum in some way? Can we just, like, go back to normal and... You know, but Adam secretly is basically like, dude, we gotta just fucking cut ties. Cut this motherfucker off, you know what I'm saying? And he's really working in secret in some way, shape, or form. Because he, at the first Continental Congress, although it's in his heart for independence, and, you know, because you understand, like, there's potential for him, like, this republic to happen, this new government to happen, where people can actually do their own thing, and we can actually bring something new to the table other than this. We can create our own nation. We can do this. You know, he's one of the very first early people to think about this, you know, which is why he becomes such a big advocate in the second Continental the Congress. But he's secretly right now just working, at least exteriorly, in the first Continental the Congress while trying to, you know, lead them down that direction. He doesn't want to let people know that he's secretly for independence. He's like, okay, we're with British and stuff like that. But if it happens to that we need to do independence, we gotta cut that. We gotta cut it off immediately, you know. So he's showing off, hey. I'm so with the British, but not but if it, if it happens, we're we're gonna do this, you know. That's how at the very least how I perceive, you know, fundamentally him being that person uh, in the first consent into Congress. So after the first consent to Congress, and they do their embargo on the British goods, things escalate. There's more people in Massachusetts. Things keep escalating and escalating. They're getting more serious in their taxes, and they're getting more serious in their conduct, and they're really laying the ground, just dominating the British are specifically and trying to stranglehold the colonists to do their bidding for the most part and the colonists they're not having it things like the patriots they're basically the sons of liberty sorry my man the sons of liberty uh, are basically just pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing and they're fighting back basically little, little 
skirmishes in it every now and then. But for the most, not, not a lot of those skirmishes. They're doing more political kind of behind the, the back stuff. They're, but they're getting ready. They're getting arms ready. They're getting munitions ready. In fact, you know, the whole point of uh, Lexington and Concord, I believe, um, the, everything that happened, Paul Revere's ride, they're actually trying to capture uh, John Hancock and Samuel Adams because they had a whole bunch of munitions and whatnot. And I might be getting Bunker Hill mixed up too. Uh, but basically, you know, a lot of this was munitions. They were preparing and the British were trying to sneak it out for the most part. And that's when the war really starts. Is with Lexington and Concord. The first shot heard around the world. So by the time that happens and the Second Continental Congress is called, you want to talk about someone who's like banging the drum on patriotism, what America is, independence, revolution, let's do this. And it's John Adams. You know, not everyone's still apprehensive, but he's coming in full guns a blazing. He's like, We're going to war and we're gonna fucking win this shit. <clears throat> and John Adams, he's just basically this ardent patriot. You know, he met and worked and that's let me let me point this out too. He, you know, he meets a lot of important people too that he hasn't had, that he probably hadn't met before. You know, he met Washington and Franklin, the first Continental Congress. He respects both of them very well. But then in the Second Continental Congress, he meets Thomas Jefferson, who was a rising star within the uh, Virginia legislature and ends up getting the opportunity to be a part of the Second Continental Congress. <coughs> Excuse me. So anyways, the two meet, and they end up becoming incredibly fast and good friends. You know, they both really enjoy each other. They're both intelligent. And you know, Thomas Jefferson, I don't think, is really an original thinker, at the very least conceptually. But I think he takes a lot of like ideas and really makes them his own in his own particular like I think Adams is much more of an independent minded thinker and things and things and he's much more of a creative individual in that particular aspect. And I think they both really went back and forth on it. And I think those two were really good fit together in terms of just I can just imagine the conversations. You know, John Adams gives this really abstract idea and Jefferson will probably form it into something that's concise and brilliant, you know, and that's how the Declaration of Independence effectively was made, you know, written for the most part. Before we get to that, though, um, by the by the Second Continental Congress, John Adams is basically banging the drum for independence. We're doing this; it's going to happen. And a lot of people, he starts getting people on his side, you know. And if it wasn't for him just banging the drum, you know, they wouldn't be preparing for war for the most part. So then, the con Congress basically is like, okay, we're, we'll create this army. And we're trying to figure out who leads it. And John Adams is like, George Washington. George Washington. And he ends up really being the guiding force for George Washington. Which is interesting because he actually used to be counsel for John Hancock, who was another p potential option. But, you know, politics again, you know, just really shapes how this country and the direction of this country would effectively go. And with George Washington effectively being the guy. But I thought, although I think it wasn't really politics. I think it was more he just thought George Washington was the guy. Oh, well, okay, partly because also Virginia, to get them into the war, the largest colony, was really important and really grand, and the one thing that was really going to help them, for the most part, um, succeed and win the war. So, around this particular point in time, during all of the Second Continental Congress, they're arguing and debating about what to do, you know? Because you understand, it's not like the moment he banged the drum, it was going to be for independence. No, it was effectively just a lot of talking about are we going to repair our relationship with Britain and are we going to succeed finally and become our own nation? And there was it was really mixed because a lot of people were trying to figure out are they going, is it, how is this going to work? Because you understand the idea of independence. It's grand an idea. And, it's, and it seems like simple to us nowadays. But back then, you know, there was nothing like this to really occur. You know, there, I mean, obviously there were revolutions and whatnot, but colonies this large, this landmass this large, and this people this potentially strong and capable, like, you know, there's, we, we can be self-sufficient, but how do we, how do we do this? You know, what do we do in order to actually make something of this? A lot of people were afraid, and in fact, a lot of people that were loyalists just wanted to go back to basically being colonies of the Great, to Great Britain, and you know, I understand that, you know, it's kind of scary, you know, I'd rather pay 2% tax than, you know, have to fight a very bloody, violent, and chaotic war for the next six to eight years, and, you know, it's gonna be a lot of hardship, and it just seems simpler that way, not in the future so unknown, you know, and then you have a lot of people who are this independent, independence-minded people, Patrick Henry, John Adams, all these people, 
And John Adams is that voice who's basically saying, this has to happen. You know, there's no turning back at this point, to be honest, in fairness. You know, he's much, he's a pretty pragmatic individual, I would say. You know, he's, you know, he's just like blunt and honest. Like, this is it. You know, once we go back, if we, or if we attempt to go back, it's just not going to be the way that it was before. Nothing, everything's changed at this point. So, after a lot of delibera- deliberation, et cetera, et cetera, and people trying to figure out what to do, Thomas Paine, he releases this little pamphlet called Common Sense, which is the biggest advocate for, you know, independence that gets disseminated all across the, the colonies, and that ends up being, in some ways, one, like, the, like the actual straw that broke the camel's back kind of thing for the colonists to basically just say, you know what, let's do it. So then they asked John Adams... Uh, the committee of five, I think, or there's a couple people, but prim- the primary people in this committee would be Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson, along with them, to create the Declaration of Independence, the document that's going to sever the ties between Great Britain and the colonies. So, he creates this committee, and you know they 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 first start talking out talking it out for the most part, a little bit, a little bit later, yeah, yeah. and effectively he ends up just saying, you know what, Jefferson, I think you got to write it, and then Jefferson's really confused, and he's like, well why and then adams is like motherfucker okay like you i'm just kidding now he's basically like look you're virginian okay the more we can get virginians into the cause the more we're going to have much more support much more capabilities number two you're just a motherfucking better writer than me man okay you just write better that's just how it goes you're you're thomas fucking jefferson you know (laughs) obviously that's not what happened but you know i'm just having fun here um (laughs) anyways he they basically start this, you know, most, you have to understand too, when I, when I say the importance of, of John Adams, you know, he has so much influence, a lot of things that we don't think of, and after reading John, or, um, um, the, the McCullough book on John Adams, um, I basically am left to think that most of the actual contents of the Declaration of Independence, I would probably say, are John Adams, or, well, in fairness, Jefferson, like, 60 40 john adams 40 percent jefferson mostly unalienable rights the idea of this republic that they're trying to create like it, it's everything you know all men are created equal i'm not saying jefferson didn't believe in it he absolutely did that's actually why they got along very well but i think most of the ideas that like i said before john adams was this free thinking individual <coughs> excuse me and thomas jefferson was a hyper intelligent man that can actually focus a lot of the things that john adams would probably write abstractly and i think both those two working together and franklin helping to edit it is such a big moment and a great combo and ultimately after writing and editing after after like weeks of trying to get this thing done they bring it to congress and again, more arguments ensue. People don't want this. People want to come back. They want to be not loyalists, but they just want the relationship to be normal again. And John Adams, because Thomas Jefferson did not like to debate people. He did not like to argue and all that stuff. This is a big reason why he ended up leaving after arguing with Alexander Hamilton. We get headaches from it. But um, John Adams in particular is just, he's the one arguing for this. He's fighting for it. He wants this ratified because you know what? There is no going back. There is no going back. We are our own people. We are Americans. We are not British. We're like five generations removed from that at this point. And after a lot of arguing, a lot of debating, and after the vote, they decide to ratify the Declaration of Independence, which a lot of people like to point out. It's funny because John Adams once said the greatest day in American history is going to be July 2nd, but it wasn't fully ratified until two days later. On America's birthday, July 4th, 1776. So I'm, I'm going to speed it up a little bit because there's a lot to cover with John Adams. And I don't want this to be like a four hour long episode. But I will try and be as detailed as possible within the relative time constraints for the most part. So just explain what happens during John Adams during the, the point after the Declaration of Independence. You know, and basically the end of the war. A lot of things. First and foremost... I guess in a lot of ways you can consider him like the, technically like the first real Secretary of War in a lot of aspects in a lot of ways. He's effectively after um, the Declaration of Independence, he effect, he basically becomes the person that helps in, see the initial supply chain for the troops and the civilians. He starts trying to raise money. He's trying to work long hours. He's trying to co- he's, co- he's corresponding with um, George Washington during a lot of this time, trying to get you know everything that he can do to help. I don't know, Washington and the colonial soldiers. He's also really fighting for the 
the, the colonial people or the, the colonists at the time and then the Continental Congress to get the French involved. You know, he's a big advocate for that. I understand this too. During this time, uh, during the Continental Congresses and now his time working for the federal government, he's not seen his family in a long time. This would be a real big point um, in terms of effectively the kind of like relationship he would have with his kids in the future and et cetera, et cetera. But it's really important just to understand that like he's giving up a lot. You know, it really wears on him. You know, imagine him working like, you know, 16, 18 hours days, it seems like for the most part, just trying to get people organized, trying to get people to do things you know it's chaos a little bit at times in certain places especially it's like hey can this city and town know it's under british control okay cool um how about this just imagine just trying to procure anything that you could possibly procure and getting it to washington and who's going to pay for it and you're just trying to print money you're trying to figure things out and it's really difficult and it's pretty much overwhelming and you know john adams did suffer bouts of depression too so you have to understand that like real depression i would probably say so for him it's a lot you know and ironically too at this time he he's writing a book he's wrote this pamphlet i guess you could it depends i think it's a book but he, he writes his book and it's called um uh basically uh thoughts on government which basically is one of the most influential books the low key influential books of all time because it's the books where it's the book where a lot of the actual state constitutions all across you know this country were actually founded upon for the most part you know it wasn't like this insane insane book but i would argue it actually has probably influenced james madison the most at the very least it didn't have everything for the most part but it did have at the very least two legislative bodies and a judicial system and et cetera, et cetera, and all that and it's a really big basis for a lot of the state constitutions, including the Massachusetts Constitu- Constitution that he would eventually end up helping create uh, years later. So effectively during this time, you know, he's trying to make the war effort much more possible for a lot of the people there, uh, during this time and for Washington, you know. And um, let me see. Blah, 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 and create their own constitution. Um, so I'm reading off my little outline list and i lost track of it um the initial battles and skirmishes go poorly i guess you could say at one point after the loss in new york for washington i believe it was uh adams and franklin adams and franklin have a really good relationship it, it's more like a i think i would probably consider the relationship a little bit like a sitcom you know there's actually a story about them when they're uh uh traveling because they actually basically go negotiate with general howe up in uh, new york for maybe some sort of peace and somewhat to maybe try and go back um although adams is not really adamant for peace because there's no going back but effectively there's a story about them and they have a very because franklin's like a bit of a hippie and adams is like a very stern i guess you could consider him like a mot like a colonial version of like a old school religious conservative person you know he's just like straightforward in a lot of ways and i would consider the relationship especially when they're in france kind of like a sitcom but anyways he goes there and once he tries to ratify some sort of peace and it fails miserably because adams doesn't want peace and Howe doesn't want peace (laughs) you know adams kind of becomes a bit of a target a little bit uh, at least for the British, you know, it would lead through you know some trouble with his family as he's trying to worry about his family for the most part, especially in that particular area. And I think it's interesting too because his son John Quincy Adams and his wife actually saw the the Battle of uh, Bunker Hill now uh, when when John Quincy Adams was a, was a little lad. So effectively around this time too, um, uh, he does a lot. That's basically it. He's trying to do everything he can just to keep his country afloat, you know? He does this for years, you know? And after basically a year and a half of just doing this ever since the ratification of the Declaration of Independence, he decides, I'm just going to, I have to take a break. So then he, he goes back home to Massachusetts. And then when he goes back home, he tries to enjoy some, some semblance of peace with his family while the war is raging on. And then he gets called back by the Continental Congress, and they're basically saying, hey, we need you in France. So he's like, oh, fuck. So then he basically says, love, hey, I, Abigail, I'm going to take John Quincy with me. We're going to go to France. And, you know, th- I'll get way more in depth with John Quincy Adams because he is a deeply fascinating person. And I can't get, I, if I do, it's, this is going to be a long episode. 
effectively speaking, though, they decide to take John Quincy Adams at the very least for purposes of his education and his future for the most part. And he's the oldest out of the other uh, two ki- other two siblings he would have uh, because I think John Quincy's about um, 11, 10, 10, 11 years old, and the other two sons, Charles and I forget the other name, but like five or six at the point at that point. So they take him or he takes them off into France to, to negotiate the French who are now much more uh, accepting of maybe assisting within the actual war effort itself. And that boat ride is kind of an interesting story itself where it's a really rough ride. You know, there's some problems, some potential people might storm the ship and whatnot, thunderstorms as well. Like John Quincy, uh, John Adams at the point, he like gets a gun. He's like, I'm ready to fight. And then the guy's like, chill. Okay, I'll negotiate this. You stay under. A little tidbit too. He learns French on the way there. Then again, you know, you're probably traveling by ship for you know a month and a half or so, so you might as well do something. But he learns French and um, learn, and his son learns French too. But he learns French more, more uh, fluently in France. Um, but he, he travels to France and he, and, he, and he rejoins Benjamin Franklin to negotiate. You know, the French joining the war. And <laughs> you have to understand that like Ben Franklin didn't really do much there. You know, he had a different negotiating style. He's much more like, I'm going to basically be the best friend of this particular person, and then we'll party together, and then we'll get them into into the, into the actual war effort itself. And in some ways, it could work, but it was taking too long. And, you know, Ben Franklin you know, he really enjoyed the lifestyle there, a lot of the French ladies, et cetera, et cetera. And John Adams got there, and he's like, bro, what the fuck, man? Like, can you all just do your work? And Benjamin Franklin's probably just like, bro, can you just, like relax and not be a stress ball for more than five seconds and john like i said a bit of a sitcom they had their disagreements but once well once he got there he really actively pushed for the french to join the war effort you know the french thought he was really fucking annoying his personality he's this brash stubborn person and they basically said dude just chill and he's like fuck it i don't care anymore and it took a lot of time but you know what after he left, it was they were in, it was instrumental in not only them joining the war effort, but specifically to get their navy involved, and specifically to help their navy basically effectively win the war, especially when they joined in the siege of Yorktown. So after 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 that, it's about seventeen seventy nine. He basically comes back. He comes back with Quincy, um, and you know he comes back home, and that's a little bit tricky too. But once he gets home, specifically. He tries to relax and rest, but he can't because you want to know why? Massachusetts at this particular point to continue their aggressive push for, you know, independence because they're basically just like, we're doing this. It's happening. Yeah, you know, we don't care what, what the British are, what they say, et cetera, et cetera. They decide to create their own state constitution. They asked John Adams, who wrote this book, to basically be one of the people who's going to help assist in this. So then, effectively... He comes back and he creates the Massachusetts State's Constitution during the war to separate the British ideals from the colonists. And you have to understand, this is still the oldest constitution in the world, I believe. I'm not 100% positive. Uh, this is more of a Google thing I just looked up out of curiosity. And I mean, if I'm, if I'm correct, it's still technically the oldest constitution within the world itself today. You have to understand, the United States Constitution would be until 1789, so... So basically, you know, he comes back home and he's relaxing and he sees something that's very, very, very scary. That's America's finances. Because, you know, once he left, there wasn't really anything that they could do. They so they just kept printing money for the most part. And the inflation rate was so bad. I think at this point, it's about 25 to 30, 30 times the actual rate for the continental dollar. Even more, made even more difficult to be that, you know, every single colony had their own form of currency. So it it is beyond scary so john adams really he tried he tries to get the french involved initially sending letters hey we got to do something and then he just says screw it screw it screw it screw it he goes back to europe and he goes back to europe with quincy and he tries to go to several different places in order to recuperate some sort of finance and he specifically i think he and quincy and his assistant john adams assistant goes to russia or they go to the russian countries and a whole bunch of all, the, all those other places in order to get some assistance and john Adams specifically goes to the dutch republic the netherlands area and basically there he's just trying to take out loans he's trying to talk to the dutch people and they're not really you know interested in getting involved especially with great britain being the superpower that they are and you know, he does get some help, he does get some charity, he does get some LA support and some people on their side, but for the most part, he spends the next two years or so 
trying to raise money for the war and trying to raise money to help facilitate you know some peace and try to keep this war going keep america and george washington alive note too that i did at one point i will admit that john adams did have waiver in some support especially during the initial um uh, war effort when he was the secretary of war but i will point out that's much more of just you know he's probably stressed you know he's probably thinking i'm doing all this and washington's losing what was what's the point you know and he wavered there's no doubt about it but i don't think it was like the worst like okay i think it was much more of a political thing if he was thinking about it, but i don't believe he thought washington was going to fail in that endeavor he stopped believing in a uh, in george washington so once he's trying to get these loans which by the way his house I believe becomes the actual first um, um, embassy, technically, which was in the Dutch Republic um, in 1782. Um, he basically gets word that you know the British they're surrendering for the most part. They're giving up, and they want people. They want they want a treaty now. They're gonna work it out for the most part, and that they've been trying to work out a treaty for the last you know a while. So they've decided to ask John Adams, one of their big guns, to go over there and do this treaty which would be the treaty of paris for the most part so he basically goes over to uh paris and you know and there's a i'll put it to you this way you know it, the, the entirety of the treaty of paris i don't know if it deserves its own episode specifically but it's a very fascinating point because you know a lot of there's a lot of things kind of political in a lot of ways too because a lot of people were trying to get in, in on this negotiations within the treaty of paris and a lot of people were trying to go back and forth. The French were trying to get involved, too, because they wanted to get their own particular influence in there, maybe some things for them for the most part. And John Adams is basically just, like, throwing a fucking wrench, you know, into a fucking uh, airplane turbine. And <laughs> and he just basically just goes in there once he arrives, and he's basically fighting tooth and nail for a lot of things. They actually try to kick him out, Um at one point and successfully do so for, for some of the meetings although a lot of things that he wants effectively ends up becoming the things that affect basically i'll put it to you this way you know he argues and he fights tooth and nail. it becomes so annoying that they basically just say you know what let's just give john adams what he wants and just do it and they all technically agree you know it's obviously not that but you know he him just arguing in general gives a lot of concessions that are very favorable to the United States, at least in terms of mercantile and trade and whatnot. And I mean, it's difficult because you know both parties would not do what they're supposed to do. America and Britain during the Treaty of Paris that would actually lead to the War of 1812 eventually. But for the most part, at the very least, if they followed this plan, it was very favorable to both people and especially America specifically. And he clashed with Ben Franklin too, especially. And again, it's just like a sitcom, man. It's kind of it's, it's very fascinating. It's very interesting. But effectively, after the Treaty of Paris is signed, the war is over. The revolution is won, and America is America. And, you know, at this point, John Adams is kind of enjoying the life. John Quincy Adams is going to school, doing all a whole bunch of different things there. And John Adams is now trying to go home. It's, it's you know it's late 1783. He's trying to make preparations, and then he gets word, hey. Can you can you go to Britain? And they ask him specifically to travel to Britain, and they find out he's going to be the the first ambassador to Britain under this new government for the most part. You know, they choose John for a lot of reasons. You know, great relation. It's complicated, but for the most part, first off, he's already there. Second off, it's John Adams. You know, he's this guy, this rambunctious individual. And King George is, I think, in very interested to, to meet him. They have a very fascinating relationship, you know. It's very cordial, you know. I think there's some resentment for the most part. And I think King George, at the very least, thinks John Adams will understand. And I think he does, because when they actually talk, their correspondence is always peaceful and generally pretty respectful of one another, you know. King George, when he, when they when they talk, you know, it's, I only did what I thought was best for my people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And John is like hey we we do what we have to do you know and not to mention too like in terms of like true negotiations there's really no one that's going to be better than john adams you know so if things go awry he's going to basically just lay the smack down on king george for the most part and there's really no one that's going to be better and it sucks in some ways john just wanted to go home this is where the real correspondence between abigail and him are really it's really beautiful it's really good and you know he just he, he's homesick 
you know he loves europe he thinks it's really a brilliant beautiful place but i don't think he sees it in the same light as say thomas jefferson would in terms of like you know, architecture the people and whatnot what he does like is the the thinking the philosophical that's, that's this whole reason why he brought john quincy adams there was just for schooling for the most part and this french and british and all these different types of ideals that anyone could learn it's a great childhood upbringing and learning but for john adams he basically becomes the great british ambassador the first ambassador to great britain in 1784 to 1785 and for the most part ends up just spending the next four years of his of his time there talking with king george just basically talking to each other like hey man you aren't holding up your treaty and of the treaty of paris etc etc and vice versa and whatnot because you have to understand like i said before you know i think it's the part of washington where i'm going to stay with madison and uh, jefferson and monroe and specifically them is that once the war is over, it's not over, technically speaking. They may have set, you know put sides away and re- withdrawn some troops from the main cities, but the British still occupy parts of the Northwest Territory, and you know the colonies aren't paying their debts. You know, like because basically they agreed, hey, we'll leave if you pay this amount, and you guys can do your own thing. And the colonies can't do that because they can't collect taxes. They can't do anything. So the Articles of Confederation is a bullshit document that couldn't do anything. So. You know, King George is pretty upset. He's just like, hey, man, we'll leave the Northwest Territory if you start paying your, your, your fair sum and your fair due. You know, and John Adams is like, okay, this is not good. This is not good. And he's basically just hammering out all the problems while he's telling people, hey, get your shit together, America. We got to we gotta fucking do this. And, you know, that's when the Constitutional Convention happens. That's when a lot of things happen. And soon, effectively speaking, the Constitution eventually gets created. It's also too in 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 uh, Europe. He actually gets to be reunited with uh, Thomas Jefferson. He comes to visit in uh, Great Britain. He had actually been he and uh, his wife had actually been trying to pull strings to get Jefferson uh, to France after his wife died, which is a which I'm going to save for his episode. It's it's actually really 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 sad, unfortunately. But he ends up coming to and they you know rekindle their friendship and you know talk political ideas, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And they really talk about what is going to happen in the future of this country and. You know, both are very optimistic in a lot of aspects, in a lot of ways. But you know, Jefferson's a little bit apprehensive, and you can see the tensions there uh, in the very beginning. But effectively, after some time, uh, in 1788, John Adams, after serving, you know, for the better part of four to five years as the great British ambassador, says goodbye to King George one last time. They bid each other farewell as John Adams returns to America. So, what does John Adams do in America? around this particular point in time it's a little complicated okay because when he gets home he tries to enjoy his life he's probably trying to have sex with his wife it's been a while okay so i don't i don't blame him try to get his dick wet um he he tries to just enjoy his life for a little bit he works on his farm tries to restart his law practice but at the very same time things are moving fast so by the time he comes back there's a presidential election on the way and he's actually seen as a bit of a potential front runner if washington cannot Except, you know, because a lot of, you understand the first presidential election really is just convincing George Washington to be president. And if not, it's going to be John Adams. You know, he's the leading voice of this radical revolutionary movement. Without him, a lot of things don't happen. You know, because yeah, you have to understand this is how people saw John Adams. You know, like he's not a perfect person. And throughout his entire life, he's this brash, stubborn individual. He'd argue tooth and nail for things that seem inconsequential but he'd argue for it if he's right and even if even if he was technically wrong if he felt that it was right he would argue it you know and that's just john adams you know despite all that despite the personality despite a lot of the things brash nature is very blunt nature <laughs> excuse me john adams was a very popular figure and one who they knew would work hard would push hard and would be an advocate and a representative of this country that they felt would be proper at the very least for the executive branch so you know in washington he gets elected as president he ends up just taking the job because it's the right thing to do for washington and it's you know they need him they need washington let's just be very clear about that and then washington and then adams he gets uh, the opportunity to be vice president he gets the second most votes and you know he doesn't like it he doesn't want to be it you know but he ends up he actually thinks about rejecting it, but he ends up taking it because, you know, he wants to save face, wants to do his right by Washington and people, et cetera, et cetera. Even though Washington really 
he and the, he and his relationship really aren't um, particularly good. And before we continue, I, I should probably explain at least some of the relationships with some of the other founding fathers specifically, at the very least, you know, or the, the important figures during that time. You know, he's very close with Jefferson, um, very deeply close with Jefferson, actually, intellectually, emotionally. They actually grow their bond closer when uh, Jefferson's wife dies, um, spending correspondence with one another. And Adams, Madison were big figures in him trying to get Jefferson to uh, be the the minister ambassador to France, um, you know, to help with his grief for the most part. You know, his relationship with Washington is complicated. Um, He thinks highly of him, and I think Washington actually thinks highly of John Adams. He's a very honest, you know, strong figure. But they don't like each other at the very least in terms of some personality traits, especially Washington to Adams. He thinks he's a bit boorish, a bit extra. Got to stop with that stuff. And, you know, it it actually hurts their their relationship for the most part because Washington really doesn't have Adams in on the cabinet meetings, and it really makes their relationship sour. You know, at least since the very end, Washington does ask uh, a lot of Adams, at least for advice, near the end of his second term as president for the most part. And also, you know, it showed signs that, you know, Adams was probably going to be the second in line. He was going to be president eventually in the what was, I guess you could say, the original line of succession before, you know, because a lot of people thought he was going to be the guy after um, I'll explain that in a little bit. Um, his relationship with Hamilton is interesting. You know, they, there's a lot more parallels and comparisons between these two in history than I think. You know, like every, every a lot of things happen. Like they were both revitalized in the 21st century, uh, historically speaking, and both Federalists. You know, they're both in a similar vein, but they just did not like each other. They did not like the direction both of these guys were going to be going in. Although Adams tended to side with Hamilton, he's the party leader, and thought, you know, he just went with him for the most part. He just went with his ideas, and, and how do I explain it? You know, Hamilton and Adams did not like each other for political reasons, specifically, just like many of the founding fathers did not like each other. And Hamilton did not like... Adams because he was too independent and too free thinking away from what he wanted the country to be and vice versa for Adams and Hamilton and that was the one big thing that really drew them apart he wasn't particularly close to Samuel Adams you know they were related and they often did come to each other for for support but eventually just like many others ideological differences would set them apart Um, very close with Ben Franklin etc etc and I would also point out to John Quincy Adams uh, his son It's a very complicated relationship, you know. I mean, he loved his son, and his son actually did love and respect his father, but it was a very strict relationship, especially when they were together. You know, he's a very strong and stern father. He wanted to to have his children succeed in many ways, and that actually ruined a lot of the relationships with his younger kids because they were not capable and ready, and John Quincy Adams effectively would be the one to step up and actually be that kind of person. I mean, he had a, a leg up, unfortunately, for better or worse, but, you know, it is what it is, and, uh... You know, he was initially against a lot of the stuff with his father and stuff, but he understood. And effectively, actually, ironically, he kind of became the similar person to his father in a lot of ways and aspects. So ironically, one of the longest periods of his time was being a vice president. It's also probably going to be the shortest in this episode. He doesn't really do a lot, you know, other than argue what, you know, Washington should be called. He argues that he should be called a king, et cetera, et cetera, and a lot of people didn't like him. And he would spend an hour trying to argue this for the most part for specific reasons, even though it's arbitrary, to be honest, a lot of the stuff that he ha- that happens during the vice presidency. You have to understand the vice presidency, and the first vice president, by the way, is John Adams. He's the first, you know. He didn't really do a lot with it, and, th- and the truth is, is that it was a bit of a vague position for the most part, you know, and they ultimately just, just, just you know, he effectively, in a role that he in some ways created himself with the Constitution itself, was that he was effectively just the leader of the Senate for the most part, and and even then, he just showed remarkable stubbornness and an inability to really talk to people and effectively communicate he was very combative in the early part of his vice presidency which really ruined a lot of his time and there's a lot of his uh you know legislation there and they just didn't listen to him and they got to a point where he just okay you know what i'm just gonna do what i'm gonna do i'm gonna whatever you know and for the most part during his entire vice presidency nothing really happens he ends up following washington and votes in favor of washington and a lot of his you know policies for the most part and you know, the, the vice president effectively is the deciding vote for the most 
you know, and all he does is just decide in favor of Washington. He doesn't do much. He doesn't say anything. He actually keeps it pretty, pretty fair for the most part. You know, it's a very un, it's a very interesting time. The only thing that would, I would say is specifically around this particular time as vice president is the growing distance between him and Jefferson. And specifically, you know, he's one of the very few casualties along with many of the other historical figures and founding fathers around that time of the ev- eventual um, ideological differences, you know, between the two people and the, between the two parties for the most part. And for him, you know, being a Federalist, effectively being a part of the Federalist Party, and Jefferson being part of the Jeffersonian Democratic Republican Party, a lot of them would have, you know, ideological battles. They would disagree a lot, and they wouldn't really be with each other for the most part and talk to each other. And effectively, you know, it was really difficult around that time for John Adams because a lot of his friends and a lot of the people that he respected and a lot of the people that he would be part of were a part of that particular party. And it's difficult, you know. As Washington's presidency is winding down, it's very clear that um, he's not going to come back for a third term. This is where things get interesting. So I think the first election in this country's history is really the election of 1797. Elections back then were strange. It's a little bit different. They they handled things a lot differently. It was actually really negative if you campaigned um, to be president for the most part. A lot of people found that really distasteful. It really didn't happen until um, William Henry Harrison. I would probably say uh, like the mid early to mid eighteen hundreds. You know they don't really campaign. It was basically just like people were just okay chilling this you know i guess you could say like this goes apart with washington's disinterested nature and whatnot but for the most part you know most people other people were doing uh, the talking for you and talking around that particular time um for you like newspapers for instance and they would basically just be re- releasing articles etc cetera, etc cetera. Underst- understand too that you know there, there were multiple newspapers in like certain towns and cities that were specifically political newspapers you know like the Federalists had their own newspaper and the Democratic Republicans had their own newspaper and they just be throwing jabs at each other and like it's kind of fascinating when you really look at it because most of the political attacks and the influence would be about who read what newspaper when and a lot of people knew this too um, but for the most part you know a lot of it was basically just political battles through media in some way shape or form and word of mouth the newspaper attacks were brutal. You know, you think it's bad today. I mean, they were bad, ugly, hatred, lies. You know, like I think it. I think it might have been the following election, but for Thomas Jefferson, this whole Sally Hemings affair was basically brought up as you know a scandal for the most part that would ruin the Jeffersons and the Jeffersonian you know ideals and whatnot. So, you know, I, I, and I, I actually think I want to go into elections for other episodes, too, because I think every single election, well, mostly elections, are really fascinating. But for the most part, the very bare-bones details you have to understand about this election is that it's specifically between a, a couple other people. But the main front-runners for this particular election was Thomas Jefferson and John Adams, the Federalist and the Democratic Republican. Adams, the Federalist and Democratic Republican, Jefferson, for the most part. And, you know, they were always, and you have to understand, too, the same thing in terms of modern day, I guess you could say, in which, you you know, you ran on a specific platform or, pers- you know, specific perspective, you know? And, you know, for... If you were a Jefferson, you probably were thinking at this point, like, because, you know, I guess you could say attacks wise, uh, Federalists were basically being attacked for being kind of like monarchs a little bit, a little bit authoritarian in a lot of ways. In fairness, a lot of it, the very least perceived and in some instances was constitutionally vol- uh, violated, which I do agree with that aspect. Um, you know, eventually the Alien Sedition Act is an example of that. But the Federalists did a lot of stuff like that in terms of trying to keep the country safe from their own perspective. And then the Democratic Republicans were basically 
you know, aligned with these French revolutionaries. Because you have to understand and remember, too, the French Revolution was basically happening. It was basically almost over. I think Napoleon around this point in time was effectively about to take over um, around the beginning of Jefferson's presidency. But this was a very tricky time, uh, specifically with France. And, you know, a lot of people didn't like France. And a lot of people were having problems with France, and specifically merchant ships and whatnot. That would lead to a lot of problems with Adams' presidency, eventually and specifically. So, effectively speaking, they all campaigned on their own specific things. If Adams was president, he was going to be strong, hard, and continue a lot of the good things that Washington was going to, that Washington was doing. Because you have to understand, he's going to be the second president. Whoever gets this position is going to be following Washington. So he's playing on that political idea of, I'm going to just continue what's, what's going to happen for the most part. And Jefferson's basically like, look, the French are ruining a lot of things. If you vote me for president, I'll make things a lot simpler and have better relations with France so they don't keep doing these things. And this is a very crucial time because there's no one other than Washington. This is, in a lot of senses, an end of an era. Okay? You have to understand it. It's really not, but the end of an era because Washington is America at this point. Okay? From 1775 to 1797, it is Washington. It is Washington, Washington, Washington. And who's going to take over that mantle, I think, is really important to think about and to conceptualize here. It's very important. Who's going to lead this nation? And I mean lead this nation. Okay, and that's why this election is very, very important. Because whoever gets to lead this nation is going to be taking over Washington. They're going to get this level of positive or negative notoriety. They're going to be the leader of America, the thing that they fought for. That's why this election is really important. And would, at least in a lot of people's minds, change the direction of how this country would go. So how does this election work? How did this election work? Because we have to understand, too... The first, I would say, five or six elections were very interesting and tricky, you know, because you don't really vote like you do today, where you vote and then you're actually voting for an actual um, voter, uh, not a voter, um, elector for the most part, who's going to basically follow what you, you're going to do for the most part in terms of your electoral votes. It's very different. You know, the people had some influence, but for the most part, votes initially in the first couple of elections specifically were by state legislatures. Okay, and by a very, very narrow margin. So if you're going to actually win and influence people, you're going to... And, and I'm wrong, it's, it's similar in the sense of electoral college. <sighs> Excuse me. And it's still an electoral college, but it just went about it in a slightly different way, I guess you could say. So basically all you had to do was just try to win the state legislatures and a lot of the uh, actual state people too. Um, and Adams would win this eventually, but you know this would later change along with the actual 12th amendment that would effectively change how voter rules will and, and how like you know people will basically be the president and vice president it's a lot of a lot of problems that came along with it so effectively uh adams wins he wins by about three electoral votes versus jefferson i think it was 71 to uh 68 remember only like a couple those I mean the 13 states plus the other five that were later admitted the total of 18 states and a total of like 18 electoral votes for the most part based off of relatively speaking state population <clears throat> and to understand the reason why the 12th amendment is really important is because back then you know whoever got the second most votes was going to be your vice president you know a lot of people debate this and it's complicated it's 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 it depends on how you interpret it to be honest and how this works because my original view of it is in some way shape or form they created this particular line of succession the way this you know how we elect people so that you know the vice president can curtail some of the powers of the president if you know the second person i think things would be very different if you know democrats and republicans were the vice president but it'd be very interesting you know be more of the you know separation of powers to keep each other in balance but also create a lot of problems because you know not a lot of things got done or was you know people nipping at your coattails and a lot of issues along with that you know but effectively john adams wins the, the technically the first presidential election but the election of 1796 1797 whatever specific year you want to call it and he becomes the second president president of the united states and thomas jefferson after years of solitude and away from the public office effectively becomes the second vice president in the country's history from two different political ideologies so when Ad Adams becomes president he becomes the first federalist president the only federalist president actually to be honest first partisan president 
I think is really fascinating, interesting, you know. And how do I explain his presidency? Honestly, it's it's a little bit complicated. You know, I, I I look at presidents, I look at presidencies, and I look at, you know, eras and times and whatnot. And the truth and reality is, which is unfortunate, is that, you know, Adams' presidency is a very, you know, influential aspect and period in time within this country's history. And it's a very important period of time, just like every single president, obviously. But, you know, his is also just, unfortunately, just a bridge presidency between Washington and the beginnings of this country, effectively, into what the Jefferson and the Jeffersonian era presidencies would effectively be, you know, and, you know, for better or worse, you know, a lot of people tend to look down on his presidency and who he is as a president, and I'm going to explain why I think it's a little more complicated than that, and, you know, it really is a little more complicated than that, because, you know, I think we're influenced by a lot of political writings at the time, and I think we're influenced specifically in, you know, some things that we if we had better context, which again, it's it's things like this that I want to have and give better context for, because you know I look at John Adams and I'm just thinking to myself, why don't I li- why don't I hate this person for a lot of the monarchical things that he ends up doing, and you know, it's not it's not all simple, it's very complicated, you know. And for every president, I'm going to talk about at least the most important cabinet members and the most important judicial appointments at the very least, for the most part, at least tell how many you know little things. So for the most part, John Adams, more or less, other than some uh, later appointments, um, keeps most of Washington's cabinet, keeps most of the Federalist cabinet at that point. Um, Nothing really specific there. I mean, notably, John Marshall ends up becoming, I think later on, his Secretary of State, uh, or one of the actual cabinet members. I'm blanking right now. I don't have it in front of me. But I know he becomes part of the cabinet, which is ironic, which I will explain in about two seconds. (laughs) Um, he does have a couple of judicial appointees, though. Three of them, notably. A lot of them are just people who are the part of the initial John Jay Corps, and they just leave. And notably, John Jay himself. And the two most notable would be uh, this one, Bushrod Washington, who is actually George Washington's nephew that he would appoint on relatively early on. And the second most important, which I think might be the most important judicial appointment in this country's history for the direction of the way this country would go, one of the most... You know, I can't even fundamentally explain how important this decision is. Is the appointment, ironically, of John Marshall, his Secretary of State, one of the cabinet members, to the actual Chief Justiceship himself? Yeah, he was. Sec- sorry, he was Secretary of State. Um, because you have to understand, like in terms of historically speaking, he, first off, he'd be on the court for the next 30, 30, 35 years. You know, he, as a Federalist and effectively just battling Thomas Jefferson and the Jeffersonian people for judicial appointments and everything. He'd be one of the leaders and effectively give the Supreme Court the specific power that it has, mainly with Marbury Matt versus Madison. But that will be for Thomas Jefferson's uh, episode specifically. <laughs> Excuse me. Fucking tacos. I am sorry. My stomach's not working with me. Anyways, you have to understand that, specifically speaking, he is one of the most consequential uh, Supreme Court justice appointees in history. I think for the better in a lot of aspects, in a lot of ways, whether, you know, your opinion of the Supreme Court is positive or negative. You know, understand, too, that, like, before we actually get into the nitty-gritty of it all, there's a lot of things that happen with John Adams. For instance, because at this point, the, the capital, Washington, never lived in D.C., but Adams would, and he actually be the first president to live in the newly constructed man- presidential mansion of the pre- uh, presidential White House. And just, you know, let me give you some, you know, preface for some of the things you know because like once washington leaves the country's in a bit of an interesting point you know at least economically speaking and technologically speaking what i mean is is that i would because the industrial revolution starts relatively early in great britain but in some way shape and form i would argue the cotton gin by eli whitney i believe that was 1793 uh, i might be getting confused um uh, but in the relatively late speaking late 1700s um early 1800s the Industrial Revolution, in some ways, really begins, and it begins in the North specifically. Uh, that's, that's that's at the very least what the economies were really pushing towards. You know, factories in the North, and and in some ways, you can argue this is where the Great Divide kind of begins because the South really, because of the cotton gin, because they're selling a lot of the cotton to you know Great Britain and a lot of these other countries, mainly Great Britain for you know their textile factories for the you know Industrial Revolution. Um, 
they're going so far into the actual agricultural aspects of their economy for the most part. Which is why I think it's interesting because you have to understand that like a lot of the stuff comes with economic realities. You have to understand. For better or worse, economies will push people in a particular direction. This would eventually, you know, later on, especially with the advent of slavery, push this country into civil war. <laughs> and that's another episode entirely. But, the, but for the most part, the economic recovery from the previous decades of war-torn debt, you know, was working positively, you know, especially with the new taxes, um, especially the increasing taxes that Adams would eventually put on for the rising board of an increased budget and whatnot, which would be later frowned upon. But for the most part, <clears throat> economically speaking, the country was still in recovery and was still working out its kinks and was still working positively to a much better degree, uh, to a better future. It was on the right path for it, for the most part. So with all the, the backstory, how does John Adams' presidency really start? Well, you have to understand how it starts is basically how Washington's ends. The XYZ affair. It's, it's a very complicated issue. But I'll just give you some backstory that Washington had previously sent Charles Pickney to basically talk about talk things out, mainly because the Jay Treaty had happened. France is upset because it violated a lot of long-standing agreements, et cetera, et cetera, with you know between trade between America and, the, and France, and it was the treaty itself was a treaty. The Jay Treaty itself was actually a treaty that was really beneficial for America and Great Britain, not France for the most part, and and you know Washington tried to sort things out in terms of neutrality, but you know didn't really work out. When Adams becomes president, he sends like a shit ton more people. John Marshall, notably, again, he, God, Marshall's everywhere, and. This motherfucker. And then um, they basically go over there. They're trying to meet with the, with France, and a lot of the people are not there. So the foreign minister is basically just like, no, we're, no, we're, we're not in negotiations at all. So then they, they try to meet with people, and then there's three people that the foreign minister sends to basically meet with them. They're like, look, if you want to have a speech with us, you got to pay us a shit ton of money, and it's going to happen, or otherwise it's not good. And let's just put it this way. You know, they, they basically just try – to basically say, hey, if you pay us this, then you can talk to us, and et cetera, et cetera. It's a little more complicated and specifically detailed than that, but I'll put it to you this way. It was not a very positive way they went about doing it, and they basically tried to bribe us into basically trying to have good relations for the most part and extort America in some way, shape, and form. At the very least, that was some of the perception of it. Adams gets word of this, and he's just... You can just imagine John Adams hearing this, like, these motherfuckers you know <laughs> you know he gets word of this and he starts thinking okay you know this is something's gonna happen you know like the whole you know, understand the whole purpose of the constitution was so that you know i mean it's in the federalist papers too i think it was actually john jay or hamilton that i wrote it um but about you know the foreign influence it's human nature people power you know some people might say it's even competence because the more power you have the more capabilities you have the more efficient you're going to be etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. Depends on how you look at it. But for the most part, Adams, being you know, the Republican person himself, is like, okay, this is a real test for us. This is a real moment in time for how, you know, it's going to be, in some way, shape, or form, how his presidency is going to go. This is French affair. And understand that, at the very least, he is preparing. So he starts getting the military ready. Um, they're, and people in the legislature are not hearing what's happening with, with France for the most part. He's kind of keeping it quiet. He's basically saying, uh, French relations are... We're working on it for the most part. And Thomas Jefferson being... And people of the opposition party are basically just like, look, man, yo, what the fuck? What's happening? Tell us, man. You're lying to us. You're lying to us, you know? And Jefferson's basically... Look, put it plainly, he's just being the drum. Like, tell us what they said, and we'll, we'll let, let the people decide and figure it out. Because Jefferson, it's a little bit of a political thing. Jefferson's like, look, the French can't be that bad. They're my homies. They're these revolutionary people. And then Adams is like, you know what? Fuck you. And then just decides, screw it. I'll just tell people. He Then he tells people. <laughs> he tells the people. And it makes Jefferson look a little bit of a fool for the most part. And everyone's mad. The American people are mad. Everyone's upset. You know, et cetera, et cetera. And it's a very testy time for America. And, you know, I mean... Adams was a very opportunistic person too, just like all any of the other politicians and 
historical political figures too so don't get me wrong and he used this opportunity to really strengthen the military increase the federal budget etc et taxes a lot of this is a very tricky time uh, you know because a lot of things that are happening within like i'd say two three years of adams's initial presence i mean it is complicated you know like you think do you think trump's presidency is complicated in his first four years or I don't know, he's still going to, we don't know if he's going to be elected or not, at least in the recording of this episode. It's probably likely, but still. Um, point being, though, like, a lot of things were happening during Adams' presidency, back to back to back to back to back. You know, he increases the military, and effectively, in some ways, really expands and creates the Navy. You can, you can argue, you know, back and forth. A lot of people are credited with it. But as Adams specifically, but I, I would say in most cases, could be considered the father of the Navy, at least the gross expansion of it and, you know, whatnot. You know, it's around this time, too, that, you know, the rising taxes, people are not happy. You know, he's not a popular person just with the taxes alone. Let's just be honest there. And it's around this time, too, there's a lot of French people immigrating, mainly because they're trying to escape the fucking French Revolution. I don't want any fucking guillotines or anything. I don't blame them. But a lot of them are coming, and, you know, there's suspicion, maybe some spying going on. There's a lot of these French, in fairness, who likes the French people? Come on. They're, come on. I don't even have to, come on. Anyways, the French are coming, and they're basically just, there's too many of them coming at this point. It's enough for Adams to really start worrying. So these, they start what would be known the Alien Sedation Acts, a lot of these things. And it starts with the immigration policy. Because you have to understand, the Alien Sedation Acts is complicated, and it's a good, it's something that... <laughs> It's a lot of things, but specifically like four or five specific legislative uh, acts um, back to back to back to back that effectively, you know, I mean, alien sedation, it's both immigration and specifically in this particular case, uh, restrictions on freedom of speech and freedom of the press in some way, shape or form. Because that's how it's, but that's how it started, though. It started with, and obviously it broke a shit ton of constitutional rules. Um, but for the most part, they were just basically trying to limit immigration and them bad-mouthing the country and the federal government for trying to stop these French people for the most part, even though it's wrong in some way, shape, or form. And a lot of people made case, like, they got jailed for this. Only like eight or nine people really did. So I think what I'm trying to say is people are overblowing the Alien Sedation Acts in a very n- negative light. It, were they bad? Absolutely. They were horribly bad, unconstitutional in every sense of the word, and should never pass to begin with. And they were passed by a Federalist uh, majority Congress, I might want to point out at that point. I believe Senate in the House. I'm not positive on that. But in order to get those things through, they had to go through a shit ton of stuff. And that's the only way I think it was going to happen. You know, those acts actually ruined his presidency and effectively ruined any chance that he had, I think, in some way, shape, or form to get a second term. That was that was a big thing, you know. Once you break constitutional rules and stuff, this document that you, as a big <laughs> believer in republicanism and whatnot, it's it's tough, you know. And you have to understand John Adams too, because like throughout this entire time, you know, when he's in Europe, you know, he's just he's so focused. He's just trying to get things done while dealing with you know his depression and whatnot and trying to be home with his family and life and you know he's just thinking and he's just trying to figure things out and he just wants to go home and do his things too and he's a human being we're all capable of making mistakes you know and especially as a president you have to understand and be put in his shoes you know i probably should have done this more about adams and in, in terms of how he's feeling during certain acts but throughout, throughout the you know the, the european revolution war times although that's pretty simple because he's just basically focused on winning the war that's his ultimate goal and trying to keep things together because he's always working but during his presidency thing he becomes a little bit different he he actually becomes i, I would say a little bit worried in some way shape, and form. i think he tends to be painted in such a negative light i i don't think that's an accurate and fair statement he's always conscientious and thinking he's always thinking about what's going to be better for the country and i think it's really fascinating in some in, in a lot of ways you know Although with some pol- like like some political stuff that goes along with it too, like you know when when he's trying to build the army up, he appoints George Washington to be like the leader of this, you know, the leader in arms again, et cetera, or whatever the leader in arms, instead of Alexander Hamilton, who actually was a much younger, more much better choice, because Washington's like sixty five and he wants to retire, and you know he Washington goes to a couple meetings and then just gives it to Hamilton, but you know, he doesn't give it to Hamilton because of politics basically, so. You know, understand, 
you know, being the president, and once you're the president, a, a lot of things happen, a lot of problems, a lot of responsibility. It's a difficult position, and it's a difficult thing. It's actually, I will say, uh, they do pretty well in the John Adams series, you know, how, you know, he's feeling during the presidency. I think they get that right, uh, at the very least. He's just focused. He's just trying to do things. A lot of things can be overwhelming, especially when you're, you know, the president for the most part. I think in some way, shape, and form, he understood, too, that once these, you know, alien station acts happened, and once, uh, you know, the the backlash was so severe, and that they were going to use it against him, you know, and I think in some ways he probably thought this was going to be, like, the thing that was going to be better for the country, and, because these acts weren't, wouldn't be repealed until, like, a couple years into Jefferson's term, actually, um, but, you know, he's always thinking for the betterment of the country, you know, which I think is which I think is probably some of the biggest problems with with Adams, functionally. Which he would not do until later into his life is that he just could not learn from the mistakes or see things in a different light in a different particular way. You know, once you get into that mindset, I'm telling you, it's it's hard to get out of it. You know, it's hard to to think in a different light and a different perspective. Anyways, back off into uh, his actual presidency itself. You know, these Alien Sedition Acts, and then it's just the absolute substantial increase of federal powers, I might want to add. Because you have to understand, this is a gross increase in federal powers. So while the acts would be reduced, the actual broad, you know, federal capabilities were widened at that point. And that would be the one big thing about Adams' presidency is Washington didn't really do that much in, the, in terms of the expansion of the federal powers, at the very least, aside from the economic recoveries and whatnot. But for the most part, Adams, Adams is the big one. Adams starts it, and Jefferson just takes off the Madison. And, you know what I'm saying? It just keeps going up and up and up and up from there. Adams' the presidency is the presidency that starts the course of where we're at now, at least in terms of, I would say, the size of the federal government in a lot of ways. But, you know, this really puts the opposition into, you know, the forefront. In the forefront, for the most part. Jefferson... Madison, who, I mean, he was, Madison was basically the opposition, he was the, the house leader at that point, or the leader of his specific party, I think he would leave, actually, after, uh, midway through, uh, Adams' first, ter- uh, Adams' turn, but basically even Hamilton was against the actual aggressive expansion of the actual federal powers, and, you know, creating, uh, resolutions of the separation of the Union, like, a lot of these states were basically be wary of it. You know, you think, you know, like, South Carolina seceding from this. Nah, like, Kentucky was one of the first states to, like, basically kind of teeter that line a little bit, you know? Um, the Kentucky Resolutions, which was basically a state's rights to override the actual federal powers themselves. You know, a lot of tension between the federal powers and the states started in Adams' presidency. You know, it wasn't... It wasn't perfect, you know, before the Civil War. You know, there would be many moments, notably in uh, Andrew Jackson's presidency, actually, where things started getting really testy around that period in time. What is undeniable, though, is that the increase of of the actual, you know, army, the military, the federal powers and whatnot, France was seeing a lot of this, too, and they were getting a little bit antsy, so they started increasing their attacks and then the united states started fighting back and it is known as the quasi war the quasi war had just started and each and again like i said before he chose washington instead of hamilton but that was more of a political thing once hamilton effectively does become the actual uh, leader to to lead this quasi war hamilton in his own federalist light is basically like look man if we're gonna be on the same page then we're gonna do this right so he ends up asking and wanting more uh war and more expansion and it's difficult because you know adams didn't want an actual war you know he just did it for protection and protectionary causes you know but and this is probably the biggest problem with hamilton in some aspects is just his he overreaches sometimes and i think he overthinks and like and don't get me wrong i think he's a fantastic warrior leader strategist and whatnot and i think if anyone's going to lead us into this it's probably hamilton but you know, I, there's limits. Hamilton did not understand these limits. Okay, I, I, I did like he did understand these limits, but I don't think he cared. And I actually think that's actually worse in some ways. Um, 
but you know they would basically both be battling each other this entire time for uh you know and the direction of what the federalist party was going to be and you know who's go- what was going to happen so basically hamilton is very war adams is not a very war person you know it was already bad enough with his image and and in fairness the people did want war they did want they were mad they were uh, not very happy i mean there's a lot of people that didn't you know there's a lot of people who are still loyalists to french and thought in align with a lot of these french revolutionaries you know and because the thing you have to understand is that there's always going to be disagreements and even back then it's not like everyone was aligned politically speaking or ideologically speaking even back then people were like yeah, you're french lover you know uh, you're fucking uh, you, you love your biscuits and stuff you you know british lover with the j treaty and you know things and people just it's it's just human nature to disagree and Adams was very keenly aware of this or at least he tried to be as keenly aware of this as much as possible so during this entire time Adams is trying to negotiate peace he's been trying to talk to France as much as possible against you know Hamilton's opposition uh to British unity for the most part because you understand Britain and France still don't like each other there's increasing tensions and it'll only get worse and worse and worse because Hamilton saw this as if we you know become homies with France you know Britain's not gonna like this for the most part you know not to mention too you know like let's just actually be like united with Britain let's just fucking go for it and let's just be homies homies with them you know what I'm saying and Adams is, you know, is a little apprehensive to to that idea, you know, because they, because Hamilton's basically thinking if we can just get trade and become these economic co- like combined superpowers and stuff, that'd be great. But Adams is very apprehensive to that idea, and he's president, so it's a little bit difficult. And I guess it's it's a little bit, man. This is a very tricky time, <laughs> you know, and so many things are happening. You know, he's. Because he's increasing the federal powers, he's increasing all the taxes. You know, understand like this is another rebellion. Fry's rebellion happens during this time, which would be a really, really, really bad mark on his presidency. No, I would, I would note though that despite the the, the rebellion, he actually uh, pardons Fry. So, remember, so basically during this quasi war, it, it lasts for at least a couple of years of just increased French tensions. You know, understand too that like. You know, this is like two years, and like, other than maybe some skirmishes and whatnot, nothing really happened. It's just tensions, you know, and people losing their minds left and right. Like, man, this French tensions and whatnot, these fucking French people, and uh, they're gonna attack us. Uh, it's, I don't wanna say it's media or propaga- propagating all this, but, you know, it, it has an absolute influence, and in at the very least, the direction that, you know, the country goes, you know? I mean, just think about it, you know, you're. It's kind of like even today, in some aspects, I, I I like to connect the parallels in some ways. That you know, like I look at today, for instance, and I think, like, oh, there's, the French are coming, and or not the French, but you know what I mean, like parallel. And then, but you know, we live our lives day by day, and nothing really happens, and yet, you know, there's heightened tensions for reasons. And I think even then, media was a very big influence back then, especially with the two different newspapers and political ideologies that go along with those newspapers. And just people in general. It's always political. I swear, it's... Even back then, people need to understand. It wasn't like everyone was united. Even political. Little, little deals and back deals. It was always happening, even back then. So basically, during the later years of Adam's presidency, um, the French Revolution effectively ends. Okay, And Napoleon ends up taking over. And it it coincides with... um, Hamilton being the leader of the army, which he ended up just disbanding the army after after that, basically because Napoleon's like, okay, we're done. We're, we're just gonna end all this stuff. So but Adams basically just had a had a hold out for the most part during this entire time, and and I gotta be honest, this is a very difficult time for Adams, especially near the end of his presidency. Not a lot gets done. A lot of things are very difficult to really to really uh, explain for the most part because his entire presidency is just just completely dominated by this by this entire war this entire thing and the political pot shots being taken off by the democratic republicans and hamilton for the most part really just slightly just tearing him down as little by little as much as he can because the federalist party is gone at this point i think the federalist party is gone at this point 
once Hamilton and Adam basically just fight each other for the most part, it creates two separate factions. You have the Adams camp and the Hamilton camp. And don't be wrong, I think the, the Democratic Republicans are very strong too. But, I mean, if they were united behind Adams, they'd probably still win the presidency. I, I would probably say. It's a very what-if moment in history, I, I, I would say. So while the, the party's a little bit split, you know, Adams does try to get as much as he can done. And, you know, it, it, it's a, it, it is debatable. I think he has he still has, he thinks has a chance to win. But the truth is, is I think he also understands that he probably won't. And I think he's understanding of this reality in some way, shape, or form. I think he's optimistic. But, you know, everything's pointing <laughs> to a lot of things that have happened in his first three years of his presidency. They make it highly unlikely that he's going to get reelected again. So, you know, he just basically tries to do as much as he can, especially since there's so much political infighting between Hamilton and, and Adams. You know, he establishes the Federal Bankruptcy Act in the uh, 1800s, which its purpose is to protect uh, traders from debtors, you know, especially since people are still trying to get out of debt, you know, and it's unfortunate. People were basically just being ruined by debtors, unfortunately, <laughs> yeah, local and whatnot. And then... On top of that, he establishes the Library of Congress and, of course, the White House, obviously. And, you know, the Treaty of Mort Fontaine effectively ends the Quasi War itself. And, little tidbit, too, he actually uh, gives the last state of uh, the Union address that would basically last until um, for about 113 years. I think it was Woodrow Wilson. I forgot which president it was specifically. Anyways, effectively, that is ultimately the end of his presidency since. He would lose in the next election. But I'll get to the next election just a little bit. Because I just want to do a quick review of his presidency for the most part. Which I'm going to do for every other president as well. So let me explain it this way. It was a very tumultuous presidency. And there's so many factors that go into it. That I didn't even fundamentally go into. Because it's so many things that go all coincide with one another. You know, war, political fighting, media bias. Poor reactions in many ways to a whole bunch of different legislation. You can argue French influence, British influence, um, just cultural influence, economic influence. Because you have to understand, just like with many of these presidents and many of these people, there's so many different factors that go into so many different things. It's not just one thing. It's many different things that coincide to create the specific event and the things that will happen that change history. It's a multivariate analysis of history, you know. The revolution wasn't one with one person. You know, it was one with Washington. It was one with Abs. Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence. Benjamin Franklin helped try to do the Treaty of Paris, you know. Like, Marshall and Monroe both fought in the war. Like, everyone did their part. And every single person had some role to play within the war itself. And in history. In every single moment in history. And Abs' presidency is really no different. You know, and it's also tough to follow George Washington and be the second of George Washington are you going to continue the same things that you were going to continue or are you just going to do your own thing you know what do you do as a second president because your president is going to really determine who, what the next president is going to do and the other, and the other future presidents or what they're going to do you know and I think that's really interesting you know he followed Washington and you know he always screwed and in, in some ways he was just screwed because of that but you know and he did not follow the examples and got it in his own way obviously as you know, people took advantage, namely Jefferson, Madison, all that. But I will say this: is in while I think his presidency is ultimately a failure, you know, and I think it's much more of a failure of the actual party itself. You know, I'm not the biggest fan of political parties, but I fundamentally understood why they were created, and I would say this is more so just the failure of people on his side, people. Who respected him and people who actually were ideologically aligned with him, failing to help him, failing to be a part of that. And it's like, say what you will about the Republicans and Trump, for instance, but they got behind him. And I think partly, I don't know if there was, I don't like, I don't think Adams is obviously an influence specifically for the ideological line and backing him, but I'm like, it's just logic at that point. And Adams had no support. He's a little. He's, he's like Jimmy Carter in some ways. I think it's really interesting, um, at least in terms of just the overall support, because he pushed a lot of people away too. But that being said, despite him being an overall failure as a as a presidency, I can't fault it to be on him. He did not help because of his brash nature, 
and he only continued to push people away. But I think his presidency was just doomed from the start because of both just him following Washington and everyone was out to get John Adams. And that's why I think, you know, he's an unfortunate recipient of history in so many ways. So what happens? The election year. The president only serves four years a term. And the election of 1800 was against, again, Thomas Jefferson, notably Aaron Burr, too, at this point, you know. And this was another election that was immensely fierce, you know. And at the very least, ideologically speaking, the election was based off of a different set of values and principles. Because before, it was Jefferson was like, I will help these French relations. And now he's basically saying, I am the president of the people. Effectively, what a lot of the Democratic Republican people and the party itself would represent. I am for the people, not these rich people and these, you know, Federalist ideas and whatnot, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And don't get me wrong, I don't like political parties, but a lot of people bought this message. They understood this message, and they actually really got got behind this message. And a lot of people, there's a reason why there's several, I would say, four consecutive presidents that would be Democratic Republicans. Understand that it was a party of the people, and not the actual nationalist idea. And Adams is basically like being painted as this monarchical figure for the most part and he was basically just like oh um, rump i'm king adams etc etc yeet you know and uh and i'll put it to you this way this is actually the first true election of actual ideological parties federalists and democratic republicans specifically as like fully formed actual parties i believe at this point and you know and and the, and the election was very contested. Adam was basically just saying, look, man, I did not get us into war. I should be at least, you know, give me another chance, another four years, and now I can actually start implementing a lot of things that I want to implement and do a lot of things that I want to do. And Jefferson, again, the man of the people. And that's just how people saw it, along with Aaron Burr to an extent. But Aaron Burr was much more of a political savvy figure at that point in time. And two things happened specifically, or two things ruined any chance that Adams had. First and foremost was just him. You know, Adams was just not a politically savvy figure. You know, he was always going to get in his own way. It's the same problem that would happen with his son, unfortunately, in terms of the politics of the future. And Adams was just... It was tough. It's very tough. You know, Adams... He's, he's so independent-minded thinking, and that's a beautiful, brilliant thing, but... If you don't know how to play the political game, which I hate the political game, but either you have to play it or you're not going to get any support because these people at this point are still in power, you know, and it's just like even today. You got you have to do it if you're going to get your way and get your win. And he just ruined it just by doing the things that he did ultimately throughout his entire presidency and then ultimately near the end of his presidency. And then number two was Hamilton. You know, Hamilton made a pamphlet. You know, this pamphlet was basically anti Adams and the specifics of why he's a failure of a president. And that a pamphlet was so atrociously negative to just who Adams was and his in his character, etc. That I would say that's probably one of the biggest things that actually helped uh, Adams functionally lose the presidency. You know, he he hated Jefferson, like I said before, ideologically speaking. He hated Burr more. I I don't think he really, I don't think he liked Burr specifically, although Burr, ironically, was someone who, at that point, had stopped him from going into a duel with James Madison at that point in time, around, that was when the Reynolds affair was happening, and, but he had detested Adams at this point as a man who basically was leading his party, or at least, you know, what he believes, his section of the party, down a path that he did not think was going to be conducive for the nation, both in terms of the media and in terms of just the direction, legislatively speaking and economically speaking, too. So, what happens? Jefferson and Aaron Burr tie for the electoral vote uh, with Hamilton pulling the strings to get Jefferson for the most part. Well, no, it's debatable Hamilton, but... I would say Hamilton helped pull the strings to get Jefferson the actual presence in himself. And John Adams gets third place. Understand. Because, you know, in a lot of people's minds, you know, you, if you're going to be president, you, you serve eight years at this point. And it's, you, it was 
custom. And what it sounds weird to say what that was a custom, but you know, the thought was if you're president, you're going to serve two terms, not one term, two terms. And to Adams, for him to only serve one term and to feel like a failure as a president and as a man, that's got to be haunting. He was embarrassed and he felt ridiculed and ashamed. So ridiculed and ashamed that, you know, someone he was so close with, one of his friends, would actually, you know, have the audacity to be president just like him. You know, when Jefferson was inaugurated, he didn't even intend his, uh, the, the inauguration itself. Ironically, the only two presidents I wouldn't do that would be him and his son. I, it's fascinating. Very, very fascinating. Well, anyways, Adams, after the four years of his presidency, decides he's going to finally and fully retire. So what does he do? What does John Adams do in his retirement? He goes home. I understand a lot of these people I'm going home. It's, it sounds pretty fucking obvious, but honestly, he went home. He went back to farming. You know, he went back. He retired from being a lawyer, and he just wanted to be home with Abigail, be home with his family. His family, his family life was a little bit tumultuous at that point in time. But for the most part, he's basically just out of it. He's done. He's out of politics. He doesn't really even pay much attention to it. He lets Jefferson do his thing. He doesn't try to critique anything. He ends up being relatively, you know, apolitical. It's very interesting. It's very interesting. I think, and let, me, let me explain my, my thought process, you know. Because I read some of the writings during this period in time for uh, for Adams. And it's very different from his uh, older years, or younger years. You know, I think for the very first time, he reflects... And this, a lot of this is with uh, his correspondence with Jefferson, which I'll get to in just a little bit. And and I don't know if it's just because, you know, when you get later in life, I'm a very young person, so I don't, I'm don't, i not going to be able to get to that point in time in my life until, you know, hopefully decades from now, well, decades from now, effectively. You know, John Adams is a very empathetic, sympathetic man. You know, he's the kind of person that has this really tough exterior, brash personality. You know, once you really understand who he is, and especially with his correspondence with Abigail, it shows that this man is a really brilliant, empathetic, and sympathetic man. But once you know he gets in a particular mindset, it's tough to get out of it. And I think for the first time, though, I think he finally changes kind of like the personality in some senses of who he is and stops being that person. I think he stops really taking a lot of that anger with him and a lot of that frustration and that fierce, ferocious debater kind of personality with him. And I think a part of that is age you know you just get old and then you know i'm tired you know because at this point was it you know 1801 john Adams is probably close to 70 at this point or let me see you know mid 60s early 60s at this point you know you get old and he would live for a very long time he's actually probably the oldest founding father i believe or one of the oldest and he reflects I think he actually starts seeing things in a much more empathetic and sympathetic way. Like, his, his train of thought really changes, you know. And he changes the way he thinks in many aspects. I think is a really beautiful and really understanding way. Especially when he thinks about, you know, the French Revolution, the Republic, and the Republican ideal, you know. And, and I'll explain a little bit about, about that with the correspondence with Jefferson a little bit later. So he takes his time, you know, he just, he's followed, he follows politics a little bit, you know, and he's basically just relaxing. He's enjoying whatever time left he has on this earth, effectively, you know, and, and in fairness, he would have a lot, he would a lot of time. He'd be, he'd be living for another 28 years or so after his presidency. So he's just enjoying his life. And every now and then I guess you could say in some instances when he would get political during the actual presidency it was only just to refute the negative things that certain political figures would say Hamilton, Jefferson excuse me you know Madison um, especially Jefferson in fairness aggressively so he and Jefferson would not speak for a very long time his wife and another person, um, I forgot who, another 
relatively known but B list kind of founding father and historical figure, I would say. Um, they 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 start this correspondence. She starts this correspondence with Thomas Jefferson, you know, to try and patch things up. It's more just like, hey, how you doing? It's been a while. We don't try. To, we won't write to each other anymore. And Jefferson's like, oh, I know. So, uh, yeah, how was uh, how's John? Is 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 he okay? Oh, he's fine. You should talk to him and stuff. He's like, oh, I don't want to talk to him. And then it's like, just, you know, getting two people who want to talk to each other on the phone, just like, oh, hey, hey, what's up? You know, okay. it's kind of funny. So basically what I'm trying to say is Abigail Adams, uh, before her death, I believe in 1817, uh, she would die much younger for younger than Adams, uh, would basically start this correspondence with Jefferson so that that eventually blossoms and John Adams eventually sending letters to Jefferson and vice versa. And they would actually have a beautiful correspondence between the two of them that would effectively last uh, the entirety of their life, the rest of their lives for the most part. Adam sent a lot more letters. I think he was very, very, you know, once Abigail dies, it's, he's basically just this old man writing constantly at his house. He does a lot of things too, obviously, but for the most part, his family just takes care of him or some of his kids take care of him. And he just starts his correspondence with them. And it's really beautiful and brilliant. You know, a lot of things get hashed out. They become friends again. They reflect on all the times that they've had before. And I, and I would go into much more detail into his uh, retirement years, but nothing really pertinent comes from it, really. The two of them basically just have this beautiful course. And the most important thing is basically just these two have a, having a beautiful correspondence about everything, everything that they've done, you know. And, and in fairness, Jefferson doesn't even, doesn't even want to talk about this. He just wants to just be like, so how's your Tuesday, for instance, you know. And Adams is basically adamant. But he, he he accepts to an extent. He's like, well, I'd rather just at least explain my perspective on things because I know I did some wrong things and I just want to, you know, explain my piece, et cetera, et cetera. It's beautiful. You know, you, you know, because you have to understand, like, look at it back then, you know. Washington in Lafayette, you know, they, ha- they that was the closest thing to like a father-son relationship that you're ever going to get for the most part, you know, but... It, there's no communication in the way we have it today. I mean, we're blessed to have that. And, and they didn't have that back then. And I mean, they really didn't. You know, when, when Washington uh, last sees Lafayette, really for the last time, you know, obviously they don't know it's going to be the last time, but Lafayette's going to France, and they really don't know if they're going to see each other again. They they wouldn't, unfortunately. And Washington, for one of the very few times in his life, actually gets really, really noticeably emotional and sad. And, Lafayette, you know, makes these things and it's like, I will never forget you, my friend. Uh, my my surrogate father in some way, shape, or form. You know, etc., etc. Lafayette, yeah. Um, for them to basically just make up the way that they did and have this beautiful correspondence and talk about the things that they do and the, and the things that they did I think if people get an opportunity, they should read these. Because, you know, obviously when you send a letter back, like now, it's really not going to be... The letters back then were like fucking like shit ton of pages, okay? Like, they're explaining everything. <laughs> and the, <laughs> like one correspondence, the one I'm going to talk about later to end this thing, it's really, really fucking long. Really long. It's several pages long. And it's hyper-specific and hyper-detailed. And it goes into a bunch of philosophy. It's, it's incredible. And I'll explain it a little bit. Their correspondence would last them the entirety of their lifetimes. Adams would grow old. He'd be a very old man. He would live for a very long time, long enough to see his own son become the sixth president of the United States of America. That's something else. You know, only one other person can say that. George W. Bush, if you don't know. George H. W. Bush. Um... But his hope is growing old. By the time his son becomes president, he's 88 years old. The letters become less frequent. You know, they both send their last letters to each other. And then one one day, on the anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, the 50th anniversary, I might add, John Adams they, they and Thomas Jefferson, they've both been in grave ill health for quite some time, actually. <laughs> And both of them are just basically strong enough to pull through until 
that particular day. John Adams, his last words, Jefferson lives. And then he dies. Well, not like that, obviously. I'm, just, I'm being dramatic here. I don't know why I'm being dramatic. Um, both of them die on, Ju- on uh, July 4th, 1776. It's ironic because Jefferson had died a couple hours earlier. It's fascinating. We've had... Th- Monroe would also die on uh, 1776 to July or um, July 4th as well, uh, 1831 or 1731 no 1831 and um, it just makes you go what the fuck sometimes you know Madison was actually really close to to passing away on that day but he ended up um, passing and dying uh, just a couple days earlier than that. History is very fascinating. Fate is very fascinating. Yeah, when you when you talk about a true beautiful friendship between Jefferson and Adams, it's it's fascinating. I don't know. I think about that and I'm just words can't describe it. So, how do we remember uh, John Adams? How do we remember his legacy, his life? It's very complicated. You know, just like every single one of these presidents. First First off, he's a man. He's a human being. Human nature, we're all capable of this. We're all capable of understanding. We're all capable of good things, you know? Like I said before, he's this very complicatedly simple man. Or he's a sim- he's a complicated man by simple means. Sorry, I'm getting my things mixed up, you know? Like I say, he's a rebel at heart. He just doesn't care. He's going to do what he wants to do because he's, again, the most independent-minded individual easily the most independent in, independent minded individual of all the founding fathers you know and it worked to his benefit and his detriment you know but you know once I do all this research and I'm trying to compile all the evidence like because if I if I just if I did every little detail minute detail that I was able to uncover about some of these people this this episode would probably be about five to six hours long and it's a lot and it goes into a whole bunch of different details from a whole bunch of different things. You know, like once you go into the XYZ factor, it's like you gotta go into why John Marshall was even appointed there, or how Picnic got even got even got, even got there to begin with. As it's a whole bunch of different things. But the truth is, is you know, after doing all my all my looking to see how these people, you know, would be would be as presidents and how their presidencies have been affected. You know, for John Adams in particular, I, I look at him and. I don't know if he was ever going to be a good president. You know, that, that would probably be the one negative downfall I would probably have to say about John Adams. And, you know, different people have different interpretations of how the president should be run and how they should be should go for the most part. But And this, this, this also goes along with his son, too, because a lot of people say his son is the most qualified person to be president. And, look, foreign policy and, you know, treaties and negotiations, that's great. And that's absolutely necessary. But does that make you a leader? Does that make you someone who's economically viable and capable of, you know, running an economy or basically trying to legislate fairly and objectively as possible? You know, it's more than just that. Even back then, it's a whole bunch of different multivariate analysis factors that basically what makes a good president, you know, and what, what specific duties and details are necessary and required for a president, like, Washington's presidency, all that was required of him was just to hold things together. You know, you could say the same thing for Adams, but, you know, a lot of things, like, war was upon Adams' presidency, so does that mean he, like, and he failed in that endeavor regardless, and I think he probably would have failed just because of his personality. And Well, in fairness, he did fail because of his personality, but most likely because he failed because people were trying to interfere aggressively so, you know. So don't get me wrong, his presidency was a failure. And and I think history in some way, shape, and form is correct in the sense of, you know, it wasn't there's there is a reason why he is not remembered as fondly as say the other founding father. Well that being said though, the truth is, is there is no hesitation of his overall patriotism to this country. The level of importance that he is to this country. You know, with John Adams, the revolution goes very differently. You know, John Adams, you know, being the president that he is, I don't know 
what would happen if you got into the term, you know? And in fairness, I will say that despite me thinking that I don't think he probably would have been the most, he would not have been a great president, or was not a great president, or was never really going to be capable of being a great president. You know, his presidency probably would have been a lot better if he got his way, or wasn't being attacked and stopped at every single you know, turn that he was able, that, that he took. You know, no one's perfect. No one's perfect. And Adams is far from it. But I would I would like to, to point out one more story. Another story of the many, many stories that I think, you know, make particular individuals. So, you know, Adams and Jefferson, they had this really long um, um, correspondence with one another. You know, very, very long. It would last decades, almost decades actually, I would say, about a decade and a half, quite a long time, and, you know, there's a lot of their, a lot of their, um, messages to each other, for the most part, were, like, hey, how you doing, how's the Rose Garden, how you, how you, how you doing, you know, you, you listen to that new Pink Floyd album, I'm, I'm just kidding, um, but sometimes they would talk, they would talk about, you know, life, the books they're reading, and then sometimes it will devolve into topics of politics, you know, and legacy, you know, and you know, the one thing that I will never be questioned, I will never question um, John Adams is his belief in the republic, <laughs> excuse me, in a republic, and at the very least the ideas of what a republic is and the love of his country, you know, I will never, ever ever confuse that with John without with anyone else. Like I it's John Adams, Republicanism and patriotism and liberty. That's John Adams, okay? He would fight for it to the very, very end. And I think he would because you have to understand when I meant that he was empathetically thinking at the end of his life and he was coming to understand, you know, a lot of the things about his life and a lot of things that he failed and a lot of things that he he that he has succeeded in. You know, he thought about the ideas of republicanism. And he thought about why did our, why didn't like because he, he's thinking about France, for instance. He's thinking about America, and, he, and in this particular correspondence you know, with Jefferson, he's he's talking about you know going back and forth between why did France succeed or why did France fail and America succeed, uh, succeeded. You know, and there's a whole bunch of different reasons that you can go into it. The whole whole bunch of different things that you can make from it. You know. And, and and he didn't stop thinking about this. He basically wanted to perfect it, even to the very end. And I'm and I was, I'm you know and I'm was always wondering what his thought process was. I kind of wish he wrote more on on these ideals for the, for whatnot, uh, and whatnot at least on the uh, modern, on his you know later ideas of republicanism. So one notable excerpt I would like to just point out really quickly is a really interesting excerpt um, that, de- that, you know, details the, sp- uh, the specifics of what, I'm, what I was just talking about. God, I'm getting tongue-tied here. It's really late. And I have Taco Belly. Anyways, uh, the one excerpt, Adams to Jefferson on uh, September of 1823. That is, quote, It is melancholy to contemplate the cruel wars, desolations of countries and oceans of blood which must occur before rational principles and rational systems of government can prevail and be established. But as these are inevitable, we must content ourselves with the consolations from which you form or from which you from sound and sure reasons so clearly suggest. These hopes are as well founded as our fears on the contrary evils. On the whole, the prospect is cheering. I have lately undertaken to reading Algernon Sidney on government, and there is a great difference in reading a book at four and twenty and eighty-eight. Cough, cough. Just kidding. Yeah, this this correspondence it was it was mainly a discussion on uh, on kings and republics for the most part, you know. And it's interesting, you know. Adams makes a point of sympathy for kings, you know, because you have to understand it when he when he was younger, you know. It, very drastically different youthful upbringing during the revolution, you know, they're no better 
Because, like, I'll put it to you this way. Kings are no better than, than men. Kings were basically, like, you know, from God for the most part. And that they were divine to rule the world. And that Jefferson, or, the, sorry, that Adams basically thought he had some sympathy for them. Because, you know, they, they did not know better. They were not aware of that reality, and they could not comprehend it because, you know, when people are, are brought up in a particular lie, in a particular, if, if I was a king and if I was a prince, it's I'm, I'm it's more likely that, that king and that prince is going to be kind of a dick and a douchebag. Let's just be honest, because, you know, you're brought up in a particular way, you know, and you're brought up to think that hey, I am this divine ruler for the most part, and. You know, I just thought it was interesting that he had sympathy for the kings, you know. I mean, he's always had some sympathy for the kings, you know, the King George and whatnot for reasons. But Jefferson, he he, he, he was agreeing. But he also pointed out that he also understood <coughs> uh, with part uh, of his own naivety that those who started revolution rarely completed like America did. You know, believing if not ruled by men like them or a stable body, it will fail. Or, uh, you know... In, in the case of the French uh, example, Bonaparte, Napoleon Bonaparte, um, which they actually discuss in length during this, this entire exchange with each other, uh, would rule. You know, and Adams, I think he always wondered, as many people back then, whether it could work, whether they knew the effect that they would have on the world. And, you know, many of the European nations and countries experienced, you know, themselves, their eventual... Uh, revolutionary attempts around this particular time, you know, the Monroe Doctrine, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's a very tumultuous time when they were writing in this particular correspondence, you know, not just the colonies themselves, you know, and I can always point to like why did they, why did we succeed as a country versus why France succeeded, and I think Adam is just pointing out that we succeeded because of I guess in some way, shape, or form. You know, the Republic. We had all these safeguards put in, you know, for a reason. He's like, I'm not the biggest fan of the Constitution, but you know what? Once you create something the way that we did, this happens, et cetera, et cetera, you know? And, and in some ways, because France attempted to do the, do, to do the exact same things, um, but it was much weaker documents, and basically Napoleon just became king for the most part. Um, that's a complicated story in itself, and I'd like to do an episode on Napoleon eventually, too. Um, but... Effectively speaking, what they were talking about, you know, they started something. It's kind of interesting to, to, to think about when, you know, they're very keenly aware of the effect that they're going to have on people and that they've had the effect on people, you know. Imagine being like the kind of person that starts something like a fad or becomes trending on YouTube or um, like on Instagram or you do some like imagine being the person that started the cinnamon challenge, you know, like. Just think about that and being like, oh, man, people are following this. Interesting. I wonder why. You know, it's the same concept for a lot of these people except for, you know, government changing and actual world changing political philosophies and ideologies. You know, I find that very fascinating. And for them, it's it's interesting. You know, Adams, to an extent, Jefferson, they both never stopped thinking. They never stopped to try to understand, you know, patriotism, liberty, what freedom meant, you know, and and I and I point this out because I don't think we think about this, you know, we, you know, people after their large historical moments, you know, I, they fade into obscurity with the ever changing world, you know, like John Adams lived to be ninety, he lived all the way to eighteen twenty six, he lived long enough to see the Missouri Compromise, a new generation of politicians like. You know, Henry Clay, John C. Calhoun, Daniel Webster, all those people. You know, you got to see Andrew Jackson and his own son effectively lead the new generation. You know, he lived long enough to see 13 colonies become 24 states. You know, he lived long enough to see his own son become president. And, you know, who, who was barely 10 when the actual Revolutionary War started. You know, John Quincy Adams. And I, and I think this particular exchange is interesting because I, I think Adams in particular always wanted to talk about this to Jefferson, which, you know, Jefferson always humored him at times. And although they would rather discuss everyday life, among other things, than reflect on what they accomplished, you know. 
That's just Adams, though. He's always thinking. He's always trying to figure it out. And I think that's just how he worked, which is why I wanted to bring up this particular moment in time. I think if he got another four years, I will admit, although I think he would have been a failure as a president, I am very curious to see how his, how he would have worked. I'm very curious to see how a lot of things would have changed, how he would have maybe legislated a little bit differently, or the ideas that he had. He's always thinking. He's a thinker. You know, he's an actual original independent mind in a lot of aspects. I think that's why he and Hamilton, you know, tend to think in a much more, you know, they're part of the same party. They actually believe in a lot of the same principles. It was just how, you know, it was literally just personal issues that really drove those two people apart for the most part in terms of their, uh, the same party political affiliation. It's interesting. And I think ultimately, I think that's what Adams' legacy should be. You know, man, he never stopped. He never stopped thinking. And above all else, more or less, he never stopped being a patriot who fought for liberty and never stopped trying to understand what liber- oh, sorry, what that liberty meant and the human condition that came along with it, obviously. I think it was finally until his old age did I think Adams come to understand these principles of freedom and ultimately the harsh costs that a revolution would take. Everything that happens back then that Adams figures out now, it's everyday custom to us. That's how I see it. That's why I think he's such a big, huge figure. Oh, Adams. Well, ultimately, the harsh cost of the revolution would take. Uh, he was pessimistic, ironically, about revolutions <laughs> at that point. You know, because the, the, you have to understand. You know, the French failed. A bunch of the other col- like colonies would fail. You know, the Haitian Revolution would be complicated. Um, more or less, for the most part, and especially in Europe, when the rise of the Industrial Revolution and people were trying to revolt, a lot of I guess you could say liberal revolutions to start these republics and whatnot all failed for the most part, which which then necessitated the many autocracies to somewhat unite to quell these rebellions of sorts that necessitated a part of the Monroe Doctrine. Like I said, everything goes along with each other. Everything just goes. It's fucking insane. History. There's a lot of ground to cover. I'll get to the Monroe Doctrine when I get to James Monroe, though. In his mindset, though, you know, people died for nothing, he somewhat thought, you know, reflecting on the many lives lost in pursuit of freedom. You know? And it's unfortunate. And I think that's... And he's he's a little bit apprehensive in some ways. Because what I mean when people lose their freedom, like lives for freedom, I mean, you should never lose your life for freedom. But if it fails... Then you know you have to ask yourself and point out, you know, what's the point? What's the point? And I think he struggled with that for quite a long time. If I will say this though, ten on a positive note, you know, the book "Discourses Concerning Government." I haven't read that book, but apparently it's it's historically significant work that defends republicanism. You know, Algernon Sidney. Um, he's one of these classical enlightened thinkers along with like John Locke you know he lost his life he was put on trial apparently before actually finishing the work and beheaded for his stance against the crown um, liberty and that is the key that I think Adams hoped would be his legacy you know if anything that future generations should follow in advocacy of freedom democracy one more and one more time liberty well not democracy not like Democracy in the sense that, you know, we think of it. Or, well, I guess what I'm trying to say, not majority rule democracy, but democracy in terms of equality for all and real, true liberty and patriotism. No biscuits. Thank you, guys, and hope you guys come back for episode three.